Ramit bhai, can you Ramit bhai, can you just stop your share sharing? Because uh, then your video will ha. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Yes. So uh Minto, now you can start. Hello. Uh, yes. Yes, sir. We'll start now. Uh I'm also stopping my video. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we are live now, okay? Sure. Okay. So I'll introduce. Uh, you know, you know, okay, live. Karte. Okay, Sapna Tai, Anup, sir. Anup sir, should I go? Uh, we, can, okay. we can start now. Okay. Chandu. Hello, Ramesh Bhai. Can you can you please on your camera, Ramesh Bhai? Yeah. yeah. You are not able to see. Yes. Now start. Yes. Uh, hello, Jai Bhim. Welcome to Digital Nalanda. Uh, ke, uh in special session me. आप सबको हम वेलकम करते हैं नालंदा अभियान लैब्स की प्रस्तुति है क्यूरियोसिटी लेक्चर्स एंड वी आर करंटली होस्टिंग द थर्ड लेक्चर ऑफ दिस क्यूरियोसिटी लेक्चर सीरीज जिसमें हमारे साथ जुड़े हैं डॉक्टर एम रमीस जो है हाई एनर्जी फिजिसिस्ट टाटा इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ फंडामेंटल रिसर्च मुंबई में and he will be discussing with us on the story of the origin of life yani jeevan ki jo shuruaat hai ya origin se us par aur kahan par hamari is prithvi par the story of the origin of life and us on the earth so uh, ramesh sir jaise ki maine kaha ki uh, physicist hai uh, scientist hai tata institute of fundamental research mein aur aapko ye लगेगा कि ये बायोलॉजी का टॉपिक है तो सर कैसे जानेंगे तो सर ने ये भी कहा है कि वो इतनी बायोलॉजी जानते हैं कि वो आपसे इस बारे में डिस्कस कर सके ठीक है तो वेलकम रमेश सर एंड वी कुड बिगिन सर आई एम गोइंग टू शेयर माय स्क्रीन कैन यू कैन यू सी इट यस सर Uh, you see also my slides right let me just minimize i'm also my connection does not appear to be the greatest so i'm going to actually stop my video now i hope no, you sure. don't mind sure sure no issues uh just to save some bandwidth and uh like subodh told you i am not a physicist uh, sorry i am a physicist and i'm not a biologist uh but um uh, in recent times th thanks to some of the developments in my work where i've been having some arguments with the community i've been looking up broadly uh, about all of science and how you know different communities think and how different bodies of knowledge fit together and um so i am excited about this opportunity to speak about a topic which i'm not really an expert on but um over my career of about 10 years in research in physics i have been in institutes where there have been biologists next to me and they have given many talks and i have attended the vast majority of them that i could and i have asked many questions and so i i have a perspective on this it is not very different from the mainstream perspective and it is this is going to be a very elementary lecture so uh, yeah thank you for giving me this opportunity तो जैसा कि सर ने कहा कि वे फिजिसिस्ट जरूर है लेकिन क्योंकि उनका ताल्लुक और उनका रिसर्च जो है इस ऐसे एक विभाग से पड़ता है जहाँ इस किस्म की बातें होती है इस किस्म के टॉपिक्स छड़े जाते हैं और वो ये जो एलिमेंट्री नॉलेज आपसे शेयर करने वाले हैं वो मोटा मोटी सत्य है ऐसा वो कह रहे जबकि ये एक्चुअली आ, ये बहुत इम्पोर्टेंट टॉपिक सर शेयर कर रहे हैं और वो बहुत ही आ, जिसको कहते हैं बेसिक हमारी 
जो फंडामेंटल जरूर क्लियर करता है और और सर हमसे ये भी शेयर कर रहे हैं कि वो हमारे प्लेटफॉर्म पर आकर बेहद खुश है तो सर लेट्स स्टार्ट विद द प्रेजेंटेशन so uh, this is how i will organize my talk um, i will basically you know we are we have all heard that darwin is the is the father of evolution so um, we will we, we will talk about what exactly darwin observed and what he concluded and then i will i will tell you about what influenced darwin the ideas of gradual change the 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 backdrop of ideas against which darwin came to his conclusions then i will tell you about gregor mendel and the idea of genes and inherited traits and how we understand all of this uh, in in a modern context in terms of the dna the genetic material inside our our cells and the idea of self and all of these together then will the then i will synthesize into what we what darwin hypothesized back in the 1800s uh comes together as uh, as a modern theory with uh, you know different pieces of uh, things um, uh, different pieces of uh, ideas from micro uh, microbiology to molecular biology to to um, uh, to how we think about how it is happening in the world um, around us today in the uh, in the uh, natural world and then um, we will proceed to examine evidence for why we believe this way of thinking about how life uh, evolves and changes is true um i will introduce you to concepts like phylogenetic trees which is a way of visualizing how different species originate from uh, different species and that will then give us the kind of framework required to to fulfill the promise of the title of this talk which is i'll give you a timeline of human evolution um evolution as uh, as uh, we discuss in this in this topic um, can only tell us about how one form of life uh, changes into another form of life perhaps a more complex form of life it is not a topic that tells you how life itself originated that is a, a somewhat different maybe related topic called abiogenesis about which very little is actually known it is an area of inquiry but we know very little with any certainty and uh, it is often discussed in in the context of questions like oh are there is there life on other planets how how likely is it that life could have formed on other planets etc um and i will tell you about a little experiment that um, that may be a bit of of rigorous science in this uh, highly speculative field of how life itself originated so abiogenesis plus evolution together will then be uh, be what i promised the origin of life itself on earth and then i'll tell you maybe about some very recent uh, developments in the understanding of evolution in the last 10 years or so the things that i have heard my colleagues discuss uh, within the institutions that i have worked in right so uh, brief mein hum de uh, dekhenge uh, kyunki ye ek jisko hum kehte hain ek moolbhut uh, vishay par uh, aaj ki charcha hai to so, hum uh, jaise aap jante hain ki utpatti ya utkranti ke jo जनक है चार्ल्स डार्विन उनके ऑब्जर्वेशन उनकी बनाए गए कंक्लूजन पर डिस्कशन होगा और जो इन सिद्धांतों पर आने की जो पूरी प्रक्रिया थी कि एवोल्यूशन या उत्क्रांति की जो पूरी प्रोसेस थी अलग अलग लोगों ने अपने अपने विचार रखे हैं उस बारे में बात करेंगे फिर जो मेंडल्स है मेंडल का जो एक थेरी है फिर जीन्स के बारे में जिसको हम कहते हैं जिसमें सारी जो जानकारी होती है हमारे अनुवांशिकता की उसके बारे में डिस्कशन होगा डिस्कशन होगा डीएनए और सेल्स के बारे में अभी जो एवोल्यूशन की थेरी या क्रांति की थेरी है उस बारे में डिस्कशन होगा और फाइलोजेनेटिक ट्रीज यानी एक ऐसे जिसको हमने ट्री डायग्राम जैसा होता है जिसमें एक लाइफ का यानी उत्पत्ति का जो एक पूरा फ्लो जो है फ्लो चार्ट जैसा वो डिस्कस होगा और थोड़ा सर ने कहा कि एबियोजेनेसिस यानी एक जीवन का ही उत्पत्ति जिसके ऊपर बहुत सारे सवाल अभी भी है उसके ऊपर हम थोड़ा सा नजर डालेंगे और आजकल जो एक जो नई किस्म की जो जानकारियां और उत्क्रांति के बारे में हमें मालूम पड़ रही है उस बारे में भी हम चर्चा करेंगे ये सब 
So Darwin was, uh, you know, uh, in his era, he was a naturalist. It, he was not just a biologist. He was concerned with many aspects of the natural world. Um, he was uh, interested in geology. He he had an early career as uh, he wanted to be. Uh, he tried being a priest and then he quit. And uh, uh, so he was interested in the natural world and he was trained in many aspects such as geology, natural history. He was collecting plants, etc. And uh, he was um, uh, he was uh, at that time there was an expedition by Her Majesty's ship. Uh, the Beagle of of, of UK uh, um, of Great Britain in those days, and uh, he was uh, hired as the ship's naturalist, the person who will live on the ship, and as uh, wherever the ship goes, he his job was to uh, well collect more samples and do more studies of the kind that uh, that uh, he was um, interested in. And this uh, image that you see here is. Uh, shows the trajectory that the ship took. It really went around the world. Uh, so this was in the 1800s. And as you know, back in the 1700s, Little Magellan had gone around the world. And so this was not a new thing at that time. Um, the route taken by um, by Darwin is, is shown around here. And uh, at each point where they stopped uh, and uh, uh, anchored near land, he would go on land and he would collect samples of rocks, of uh, of minerals, um, he would collect specimens of plants. He kept extensive notes. He would make drawings of these plants. He would make drawings of the animals. He would collect insects. He would dissect those insects. Um, he would um, collect fossils. These are preserved uh, uh, specimens of very um, of uh, life that died a long time ago uh, between rocks and other such minerals. And uh, he 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 kept extensive notes. And um, um, uh, his 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 the, the the kind of questions he started asking himself were um, were for example he noticed that in both Argentina and Australia uh, they had very similar grassland ecosystems but very different animals and also the grassland ecosystems in both of these uh, different continents uh, uh, countries in different continents were similar to the grassland ecosystems in Europe but there were different and there were i mean in europe there again were very different animals so why why was this so and he asked himself questions like why were there no rabbits in australia no kangaroos in england and most importantly the uh, the 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 studies which gave him the most um, profound reasons to think were from the samples he collected in the galapagos islands which is this region near south america and north america um, which i will talk about on the next slide तो जैसे सर ने कहा कि हम शुरुआत जो है जनक के ही बारे में जानकारी से कर रहे हैं जैसे चार्ल्स डार्विन इनका सब परिचित है इनसे लेकिन उनके बारे में काफी कम ही लोग जानते हैं कि वो एक नेचुरलिस्ट थे यानी एक जिसको हम कहते हैं निसर्ग के जानकार या निसर्ग की जो एनालिसिस करते हैं उसके वो थे उन्होंने प्रीस्टहुड भी ट्राई उसमें भी एक अपना आजमाइश की थी लेकिन वो उनसे नहीं हुआ तो उनको जो क्वींस शिप है जिस जो एक वोएज थी या एक ब्रिटिश गवर्नमेंट द्वारा ब्रिटेन ने जो एक शिप बनाई थी जो जगह जगह दुनिया भर में घूम कर एक अपना जिसको कहते हैं स्पेसिमन कलेक्ट कर देती है और वहां की जो नेचुरल जो धरोहर नेचुरल रिसोर्सेस है या फिर नेचर है वहां का उसको स्टडी करने की वो एक वोएज थी जिसमें चार्ल्स डार्विन मुख्य रूप से थे तो ये जो आपकी स्क्रीन पर दिख रहा है ये उनकी वोएज रही इन इन जगहों पे वे रुके और वहां वहां उन्होंने क्या क्या कलेक्ट किया वहां की पहले तो जियोलॉजी जानी वहां का इकोसिस्टम जाना वहां पे किस किस्म की लैंड है वो देखी वहां किस किस्म के प्लांट्स है वो देखे जा, जानवर कैसे है वो देखे और उनकी ड्राइंग्स बनाई उनके बारे में अगर वहां के कुछ इंसेक्ट्स है उनको डायसेक्ट करके उनके बारे में जाना तो उन्होंने ये पाया कि अर्जेंटीनिया और ऑस्ट्रेलिया ये जो दोनों एकदम टोटली अलग अलग दिशाओं में है लेकिन उनके ग्रासलैंड इकोसिस्टम भले ही सेम है लेकिन वहां पर जानवर जो है वो अलग है क्योंकि रैबिट्स वहा ऑस्ट्रेलिया में हमको 
नहीं दिखते और जो कंगारू ऑस्ट्रेलिया में वो इंग्लैंड में हमको नहीं दिखते तो इस तरह की उनकी ये वोएज रही है उनका ये जो स्थान है ये बहुत इम्पोर्टेंट मकाम दिखता है और गैलापेगोस आइलैंड में जो शोध हुआ जिस बारे में सर अभी नेक्स्ट स्लाइड में बात करेंगे ये सर सो in in galapagos islands um what he 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 uh, they can barely fly and uh, they they later on came to be called darwin finches they were named after him um and also uh, the the this bird which survives to this day which is called the blue footed booby Uh, and marine iguanas these um, uh, reptiles uh, which um, uh, live near the ocean um, uh, these are the kind of animals um, and he found that these and these animals were there on different islands with sub, uh, uh, of the different islands of the same island chain with subtle differences uh, between them and uh, uh, during the journey home so he started asking himself the question uh, is there a common ancestor to these uh, same separate species more specifically the islands had a great diversity among them which is the smallest and lowest islands were hot and dry uh, whereas the and nearly barren so they were like deserts um for example the hood island that you see um, uh, here whereas um, the and, and so they had very sparse vegetation the higher islands had greater rainfall and different so you know uh, uh, the its mountains that stop water uh, stop moisture in the air and cause rainfall so islands which had a higher elevation had much higher rainfall and and a different set of plants and animals uh, in specific for example the isabel island uh, was at a much higher elevation so it had much richer vegetation and he found for example that um, of the four animals I, uh, from um, i spoke about in the previous slide uh we will examine just the case of land tortoises here he found that the tortoises from each island were distinct for example um um uh, they uh, he could by uh, by uh, uh, by observing them uh, now if you showed him a separate uh, a new tortoise he could tell you which island it was from and what he found was for example that um Uh, uh the the characteristics of many animals and plants varied noticeably among the different islands the shape of the shell corresponds to the different habitat for example the hood island tortoise which you see on the right um has a, a long neck and a sh shell that is curved and open around the neck and legs allowing it to move around more and it can move its neck more and uh, and um, uh, so it is able to reach the more sparse vegetation of the island whereas the tortoise from isabella island had a very short neck and it had a dome shaped sh shell and um, on this island for example the vegetation is much more abundant and closer to the ground so the tortoise doesn't really need to move its neck around more and the the tortoise uh, tortoise on the pinta island on the other hand had something in between the two it didn't have a very long neck it had an intermediate length neck and uh, its shell was uh, allowing Uh, as uh, an intermediate le level of mobility between the two and um these are the kind of um, ideas he noticed and he also found similar uh, va variations among the same uh, kinds of animals uh, of the four kinds that i spoke about in the previous slide among the different islands hello तो गैलापैगोस आइलैंड का जो शोध था वो एक बहुत ही गेम चेंजर किस्म का शोध रहा क्योंकि उन आइलैंड में वेरियस किस्म के एक आइलैंड का समूह था आइलैंड यानी जिसको हम मराठी में बेट कहते हैं या जजीरे कहते हैं हिंदी में तो इन इन आइलैंड का जो इन आइलैंड में ही किस्म किस्म के जानवर थे लेकिन उनमें बहुत मूलभूत जिसको सर ने कहा कि थोड़ा सा डिफरेंस था तो हमने सर ने जैसे कहा कि जो बड़े आइलैंड्स थे इनमें जैसा इसाबेला आइलैंड जो है वो बड़ा है वहां पर रेनफॉल ज्यादा थी वहां ग्रीनरी या वेजिटेशन ज्यादा था 
और जो छोटे आइलैंड थे वहां वो हम नॉर्मली हॉट और ड्राई थे और नीचे की लेवल पे थे तो वहां वेजिटेशन कम था तो आप देखेंगे कि ये हुड आइलैंड जो कि बहुत छोटा आइलैंड थे वहां की टॉर्टॉइस की जो गले की लंबाई है वो ज्यादा थी क्यों क्योंकि वहां वेजिटेशन कम होने से उसको अपना गला मूव करते आना चाहिए वही हम ईसाबेला आइलैंड के जो टॉर्टॉइस में देखते हैं वहां पर देखें कि उसकी जो गर्दन है उसकी नेक है वो छोटी है क्योंकि वेजिटेशन या खाने के लिए उसको ज्यादा सर मूव करने की जरूरत नहीं थी तो डार्विन ऐसे थे कि वो टॉर्टॉइस को देख के बता देते थे कि ये किस आइलैंड से ताल्लुक रखता है ये कहाँ का है तो ये जो बेसिक डिफरेंस था सेम जानवरों में लेकिन उनके अपने अपने हैबिटेट जिसको हम कहते हैं उनके अपने अपने कंडीशंस की वजह से जैसे सर ने डार्विन फिंचस की बात की मरीन इगुआनास जो वहां मिले थे उनकी बात की तो यही जानवर अलग अलग जगह पे जब आप देखेंगे तो उनकी जो फिजिकल प्रॉपर्टीज में जरूर आपको चेंज दिखेगा ये सब so around this time the way people think about you know the world around them like uh, how the continents and the the land masses of the planet evolved etc was changing and also about how geological features um, uh, on earth such as mountains volcanoes etc came to be that was also changing uh, in uh, in particular there were these works by james hutton the theory of geological change um and uh, charles lael principles of geography in which they argued for the case of what is called continental drift today it is known as uh, uh, you know the idea that uh, the earth's crust has these plates tectonic plates which are slowly moving with respect to each other and uh, in regions where they collide the they stretch out to form these mountains which slowly grow over uh, over uh, thousands of years and um, uh, the 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 grand theme of all of these ideas was of gradual continuous change creating all the features around us both both the the layout of the continents as we see in a map today and also the geological features such as mountains and volcanoes etc and around this time also the religious dogma in europe that uh, you know uh, the earth is about a few thousand years old that idea was being um, challenged and it was being replaced with the idea that it must be much older than that uh, millions of years old because uh, uh, because of um, uh, uh, because of the time scales for which uh, these sort of um, uh, gradual change uh, uh, occur the time scales over which these sort of gradual changes changes occur and the and the layout of the planet around us uh, has evolved and these are the ideas that uh, darwin was influenced by um but more importantly evolution as a concept for life had already been discussed by someone um, called jean baptiste lamarck um his idea of evolution is uh, a little different from what a uh, modern uh, biologist think of as evolution he had this idea that animals tend to become uh, or organisms tend to become more perfect um uh, as time progresses and he used the example of a giraffe's neck uh, to uh, to to uh, explain it and he also had the idea that, uh, that uh, to use an organ more would make it bigger and to use it less would cause it to wither away and he used this to ex explain how for example uh, birds uh, got wings instead of forearms and he had the idea of something called inheritance of acquired uh, traits and uh, it's better i explain it using an example rather than uh, than the idea so Uh, just to 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 e examine lamarck's ideas more um more um, extensively his idea was that uh, an animal like giraffe would originally have a short uh, the, its ancestor would have a short neck but then to reach food at a higher reach uh, uh, you know uh, your voice uh, bro broke in between so. Know, at a higher elevation and in be carried to the next generation uh sorry do you hello yes sir please continue sir no issues 
Yeah, um, and that this change which happens during the lifetime of one organism would be inherited to the next generation and that it would keep stretching. And so this was uh, this was the idea uh, of Lamarck's evolution. Um, he also had the so if 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 you believed in Lamarck's idea of evolution, for example, a blacksmith would you know uh, uh, over his life uh, continue to work, um, um, uh, and he would get strong muscles because of swinging the hammer, and then his sons would inherit those strong muscles. And in those days. Uh, Blacksmithy was actually uh, an, an inherited um, profession. Uh, the, the sons of blacksmiths became blacksmiths. So there was no direct evidence to actually contradict this. It had to be, these ideas had to be tested um, in, um, in um, uh, experimental uh, conditions because the context of social conditions then was that you couldn't really argue that this experiment was, um, was uh, uh, sorry, Lamarck's ideas were wrong. And uh, to, to sort of test these ideas, an uh, um, a biologist known as August Weissman, he carried out uh, uh, experiments with white mice, uh, white mice, who um, he took 68 white mice and over five generations, he kept cutting off their tails. And uh, he reported that 901 young were produced by five generations of artificially mutilated parents and yet there was not a single example of um, of uh, the next generation having either a shorter tail or no tail or even a rudimentary tail or any other abnormality. So uh, Weissman argued that this meant that the inheritance of acquired traits couldn't be true because even over five generations in white mice, if you keep cutting off their tails and making them reproduce, the next generation continued to have perfectly long tails. And so this idea that Lamarck's ideas of evolution um, uh, was disproved. Now, um, uh, this uh, has been uh, debated in the biology community that this experiment doesn't actually uh, disprove the idea of, uh, of Lamarckian evolution because Lamarck argued that it was use and disuse which made uh, an organ longer or shorter or that sort of evolution and that artificially cutting off the tails of mice does not produce the same effect, which is why it does not lead to Lamarckian evolution. Uh, it does not lead to a falsification of the idea of Lamarckian evolution. But nevertheless, um, the idea of inheritance of acquired characteristics was strongly disfavored by this experiment. And so Lamarck's evolution was, was not widely ac uh, accepted, but, um, but Darwin nevertheless was influenced by Lamarck. I will let Subodh uh, translate and then we'll go on to the next slide. Yes. So, we know that Darwin was influenced by the influence of the king. Because Darwin was also there in the time of Darwin. There were such people in the lake that had given the idea of his thoughts in which we will see a shape-up. We will see that James Hutton was a person who wrote the theory of geological change. And his उस उस धारा में ही उन्होंने देखा कि हर एक जो विभाग है हर एक जिसको हम आजकल कॉन्टिनेंट बोलते हैं यार हर हर एक जो लैंड मासिस है वहाँ की जियोलॉजिकल अपनी एक व्यवस्था होती है ऐसे ही चार्ल्स लील की जो इसको हम बहुत सबसे इसको हम जानते हैं कि कॉन्टिनेंटल ड्रिफ्ट के बारे में जैसे नहीं कॉन्टिनेंट कुछ कुछ मीटर्स एक अपनी जगह से हट रहे हैं उसको लेकर भी तब की थियरी चार्ल्स लेल द्वारा प्रचलित थी और उस उसी से ही जैसे हम जानते हैं कि वो जब पास आते हैं तो माउंटेन्स की रचना होती है और दूर जाते हैं तो एक किस्म की वहां पर धीरे धीरे अपनी अलग अलग अपनी श्रेणियां या अपने अपने जियोलॉजिकल डेवलपमेंट वहां वो करते हैं तो इसी के साथ इन इन लेखकों का तो असर था ही लेकिन सबसे ज्यादा असर लामार्क जो थे जॉन बैप्टिस्ट लामार्क उनका सबसे ज्यादा असर जार्विन पे दिखता है और जॉन बैप्टिस्ट लामार्क ने क्या कहा था तो जॉन बैप्टिस्ट लामार्क ने कहा था कि एवोल्यूशन जो है या जिसको हम उत्क्रांति या कहते हैं वो एक परफेक्शन की तरफ जाने का एक मार्ग है यानी 
उन्होंने एक एग्जाम्पल दिया कि जिराफ की जो गर्दन है वो परफेक्शन की तरफ जा रही है दूसरा उन्होंने क्या रखा था कि ये जो यूज एंड डिस यानी अगर आ, कोई पंछी पंखों का यूज करता जाता है तो उसकी नेक्स्ट जनरेशन को पंख मिलेंगे लेकिन डिस करेगा तो वो उस उस जनरेशन की नेक्स्ट जनरेशन में मे भी नहीं मिलेगा जैसे हम देखते हैं मुर्गियों को जो पंख है वो उतने ज्यादा फ्लाइट के नहीं होते इस तरह और उन्होंने जो ये बोला था कि इनहेरिटेंस ऑफ एक्वायर्ड ट्रेड्स यानी एक्वायर्ड ट्रेड्स मतलब अपनी पेरेंट्स की जनरेशन से जो उनको ट्रेड्स मिलते हैं उनको एक जिसको प्रैक्टिसिंग एक उनकी आदतें होती है उस उस ही हिसाब से वो नेक्स्ट जनरेशन उसको इनहेरिट करता है है ना तो जैसे जिराफ यहाँ पे हम देख रहे हैं कि जिराफ जो है वो जितना ऊपर समझो वो अपनी जो लीव्स खा रहा है पेड़ की जो टहनी पे लीव लटके होते हैं उस उस हिसाब से हर जनरेशन ने उनकी गर्दन में लंबाई का हमने वो देखा है कि बढ़ा बढ़ोतरी देखी है क्यों बढ़ोतरी देखी है क्योंकि ये हर जनरेशन में ये लंबाई जो है वो बढ़ती जाती है ताकि जिराफ जो है उस लंबाई पे टहनी पे हुए टहनी पे लगे हुए लीव्स को वो खा सके लेकिन लामार की इस थेरी को भी ऑगस्ट वीज मैन ने डिसअप्रूव किया उन्होंने किया कि ऐसा जरूरी नहीं क्योंकि उन्होंने बोला कि अगर किसी लोहार का बेटा लोहार की मसल्स होती है और तब क्या था लोहार का बेटा लोहार का ही काम करता था तो कहा कि अगर लोहार का बेटा पैदा होता है तो उसमें तो नेचुरली मसल्स फॉर्म होनी चाहिए लेकिन ऐसा देखा नहीं जाता है और इसको ही उन्होंने एक्सपेरिमेंट तौर पे किया कि सफेद चूहे दिए और सफेद अड़सठ सफेद चूहों की पांच जनरेशन तक उनकी पूछ काटते जा रहे थे और लेकिन ये देखा कि उन अड़सठ चूहों के जो बच्चे निकले उनको सबको चूहे उनको सबको पूछ पूछ के साथ पैदा हो रहे थे वो किसी किसी में भी ऐसी कम पूछ या छोटी पूछ का कोई भी नामो निशन था नॉर्मल पूछ के साथ वो पैदा हो रहे थे तो ये कह के ऑगस्ट वीजमेन ने लामार की थेरी को नकारा जरूर था लेकिन लामार की थेरी इस मामले में नकारी नहीं जा सकती क्योंकि चूहे की पूछ का यूज हो रहा था वो डिस में नहीं थी तो यूज होने के कैरेक्टर के कारण वो नेक्स्ट जनरेशन में जा रही थी अब अब कालांतर से लामार की इस थेरी को उतना ज्यादा तवज्जो नहीं मिली लेकिन फिर भी लामार का हम देखते हैं कि सबसे ज्यादा असर डार्विन के ऊपर था ये सब सो सो डार्विन वाज आल्सो इन्फ्लुएंस्ड बाय डेवलपमेंट्स इन इकोनॉमिक्स एट दैट टाइम एंड दिस वाज इन पर्टिकुलर द आइडियाज ऑफ थॉमस मालतुस who was a 19th century english economist he argued that um, uh, as population grows there would always be insufficient living space and um, uh, while population would grow as a geometric progression that is like 2 4 8 16 like that you know because each generation gives birth to a certain number of uh, but food production could only grow by by arithmetic progression so 2 4 6 8 uh, a much slower growth and as a result uh, there would always be insufficient living space and insufficient resources insufficient food and this was an idea in economics that uh, malthus had prop uh, propagated at that time and uh, darwin uh, uh, while, well um, whether the question of whether these ideas apply to economics today is, uh, is 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 highly questionable but darwin was influenced by this idea in his theory on the evolution of animals and so he proposed uh, that evolution occurred as a result of natural selection and uh, unlike, not like Ra lamark said as a result of uh, the inheritance of acquired characteristics um uh, darwin argued that within a population there would always be more offspring in each generation than can survive and because of limitations of space and food just like malthus uh, propagated in uh, propounded in economics uh, uh um, darwin propounded this for animals so any species let's say uh 
uh, 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 to competition. Oh, the sorry. Uh, I, I, yep. uh, am I audible now? Yes, sir. Over okay. production. So, can you begin? Yeah. Uh, so. Um, uh, Darwin argued that overproduction of the kind Malthus proposed in economics uh, is naturally happening in the in the um, in the biological world. Uh, any species would uh, keep producing more offspring than there are resources required for the offspring. So let's take a species like lions. They 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 depend on having prey such as deer, antelope, or wild beast in the in in a, in its ecosystem. But uh, there would always be more lions than there are food. There is enough uh, than there is food for, and uh, as a result, um, there is always a limitation in the uh, in in the amount of space and food available for for any species. This leads to competition between the individuals for the available food uh, and space and the opportunity to reproduce. That is the number of mates. Um, and among these individuals, there is also variation. Some, some lions are probably stronger than other lions. Some lions are fitter. And as a result, the only the individuals which are the most fit survive while the others uh, die out. And so uh, by, by putting together the ideas of competition, uh, variation and overproduction within species, uh, he came up with the idea of the survival of the fittest, which is that only the fittest individuals uh, the ones who are most likely to survive live long enough to reproduce. And he came up with the idea of transmission of favorable traits. This is different from uh, inheritance of acquired traits in the sense that because only the offspring of the fittest in, in uh, because only the fittest individuals will reproduce, the offspring of the fittest individuals will inherit the favorable variations that enable their parents to, uh, to be fit in the first place and um, uh, an accumulation of favorable variations will gradually lead to the appearance of new of changes uh, of the same kind that uh, Lamarck argued. So in, in, in Darwin's understanding, it is not that a giraffe tries and reaches his neck and his neck gets longer and then that gets inherited to the next generation. It is that there is always a population of giraffes of slightly varying neck lengths and uh, the ones which have a longer neck survive. And as a result, only the ones which have longer necks reproduce and produce babies. And consequently, this uh, characteristic gets uh, uh, inherited to the next generation. And um, eventually, the neck gets longer and uh, much. Uh, uh, and what we think of as the modern version of the giraffe with a long neck, a species originates. The weakness in Darwin's theory uh, in that time was that it does not it does not explain why there are variations between. So we do observe this in nature that not every lion is the same, not every human being looks the same. Some are shorter, some are taller, some are stronger. Again, uh, not every giraffe has the same length of a neck. What is the reason for this variation? He had no mechanism to explain for this. Because at the time of Darwin, the, nothing much was known about genetic inheritance. So I will uh, go back to, uh, I will let Subodh uh, translate this before I uh, move on to the next slides. Yeah. So Darwin par uh, Lama ke alawa, uh, economist, uh, economist jo the, Thomas Malthus, uh, jinka population pe bhot kaam tha, unka bhot asar tha. तो उनके एक सिद्धांत को ने बहुत सीरियसली लिया जिसमें उन्होंने कहा कि जिस किस्म से पॉपुलेशन बढ़ती जिस किस्म से जिसको हम कहते हैं लोगों की तादाद बढ़ती है जन जनसंख्या बढ़ती है तो उस हिसाब से क्या होगा कि जो रहने की जगह है वो कम हो जाएगी खाने खाना जो है वो कम पड़ेगा उन ज्यादा लोगों के लिए और अब डार्विन ने क्या किया इन चीजों को एनिमल लाइफ पर अप्लाई किया है ना एनिमल लाइफ पर उन्होंने उनों, देखा कि ये जो थेरी है जो जन मान जन संख्या पर मैल्थिस की लगती है वो एनिमल लाइफ पे आ, लगाई और उसमें उन्होंने क्या पाया कि उस डार्विन ने बहुत बहुत सारी जिसको हम कहते हैं इम्पोर्टेंट उसमें बात की उन्होंने कहा कि नेचुरल सिलेक्शन की जो आ, बात है इसको हम कहते हैं कि जो कुदरती अपने आप 
एडेप्टेशन या सिलेक्शन की जो पूरी की पूरी प्रोसेस है ये इस ये ही जिसको बोलते हैं ना एवोल्यूशन का ये उत्पत्ति या उत्क्रांति का बेसिस रहा है यानी नेचुरल सिलेक्शन का मतलब ये है कि देखिए एक पेरेंट से ये इतने बच्चे हुए अब इन बच्चों को उन बच्चों की जो सर्वाइवर थी सर्वाइव उस उन बच्चों में वो इतने बच्चे पैदा कर पाए जो वहां पर सर्वाइव कर पाए क्योंकि वहां पर स्पेस उतनी थी और फूड उतना था ये उतना प्रोडक्शन या उतनी ही कैपेसिटी उन पेरेंट्स में थी दूसरा था अब वहां पर खाने खाने की और जगह की जो लिमिटेशन uh, है और रिप्रोडक्शन की भी या प्रजनन की जो लिमिटेशन है उसको ध्यान में रख के कंपटीशन भी हो uh, होता है यानी इन प्रजातियों में इन जानवरों में जो नेक्स्ट जो लेवल uh, uh, है वो कंपटीशन की और uh, इनमें वो वेरिएशन आते हैं जो इनको जिसको हम कहते हैं फिट इन इन कंडीशन में फिट रहने के लिए अपने अंदर वो वेरिएशन उनमें पैदा होते हैं या आते हैं अब इनमें सर्वाइवल ऑफ द फिटेस्ट जो आपने देखा है कि वही टिकता है जो सबसे ज्यादा फिट होता है और जिसकी ताकत होती है प्रजनन करने की नेक्स्ट जनरेशन में जाने की और इससे इसके बाद उन्होंने डार्विन की जो नेक्स्ट वो थी कि ये जो फेवरेबल ट्रेड्स थे कि जो अडेप्टेड चीजें थी जो टिके रहने की या सरवाइव करने की जो जद्दोजहद में उस जानवर ने पाई है वो नेक्स्ट जनरेशन तक ट्रांसफर होगी क्योंकि उसने वो पाई है और वो नेक्स्ट जनरेशन में जाएगी जो लामार्क से उन्होंने लिए थी अब उन्होंने और एक उसमें किया कि ऐसे ही फेवरेबल ट्रेड्स को लेके हम देखते हैं कि उनका अक्यूमुलेशन होता है उनकी एक विशिष्ट प्रजाति बनती है और नई किस्म की प्रजातियों का जन्म होता है लेकिन इस एवोल्यूशन के सिद्धांत में एक वीकनेस थी उन्होंने जो जेनेटिक बेसिस जो था एक ही स्पीशीज में समझो एक जिराफ है तो एक जिराफ की सारे सारे जिराफों की सबकी गर्दन की लेंथ सेम नहीं होती एक ही माँ बाप के बच्चे जो जिराफ के मे भी उनकी अलग अलग हाइट हो सकती तो उसका आंसर इस थ्योरी में नहीं था तो हम आगे इस बारे में बात करेंगे सब सो जस्ट एज अक असाइड डार्विन पब्लिश इज ओरिजिन ऑफ स्पीशीज इन एटीन फिफ्टी नाइन एंड दिस वॉज अराउंड द सेम टाइम दैन मार्क्स एंड एंगल्स वर वर्किंग ऑन देर आइडियाज and in 1860 in a letter addressed to engels marx stated that um that darwin's book contains the basis in natural history for our view uh, and um uh, marx agreed with darwin that society like living beings on earth is the result of historical processes of change and marx was at that time marx and engels were formulating the philosophical idea of uh, theory of historical and dialectical materialism but um marx also attacked darwin's theory it applies the social victorian model to nature uh, the the idea of malthusian idea of competing for resources he thought it was too capitalist and against the idea of class struggle but this is just a quick aside i, I do not want to focus too much on this um it is just that uh, um uh, very few were convinced by darwin at first because Uh, in fact I, i would say even today you will come across many people who will deny evolution um, um uh, especially on a religious basis there are fundamentalist muslims fundamentalist christians etc who argue that uh, evolution did not happen that we were all created by god and it's not we did not evolve from an earlier species etc but marx and engels were you know uh, from the onset um, embracing this idea and um uh there was there were many debates between in for example voice. bishop wilberforce had uh, many such debates that um uh, that um uh, evolution gained uh, some amount of acceptance and this is something that i observe also in various other sciences 
that science seems to progress through debates between contradicting ideas. I will, I will let's go translate and then we can move on to the next slide. So, काल मार्क्स का बहुत प्रभाव था और काल मार्क्स जिस तरह के का उनकी थ्योरी थी इकोनॉमिक्स को लेकर और सोसाइटी को लेकर उसमें वे बहुत एक किस्म के वो चिंतक रहे हैं तो उन्होंने डार्विन के इस बुक को लेकर अपने असिस्टेंट एंगल्स को एक लेटर लिखा था कि ये जो नेचुरल हिस्ट्री जो है ये कुदरत की हिस्ट्री जो डार्विन ट्रेस कर रहे हैं वो हम हम आ, आ, ये हमारे लिए भी बहुत इम्पोर्टेंट है और उसका उन्होंने स्वागत भी किया और उन्होंने ये भी कहा कि हिस्टोरिकल प्रोसेस ऑफ चेंज जो है ये जो चेंज की जो ये पूरी ऐतिहासिक प्रोसेस है ये ही हम हमारे अभी के जीवन को अभी तक डिफाइन करती है या हमारे समाज को उसने डिफाइन की है लेकिन इस इस बात से वे एग्री करते थे डार्विन की लेकिन इसी के साथ डार्विन की थ्योरी को उन्होंने क्रिटिसाइज भी किया क्यों क्योंकि जो सामाजिक विक्टोरियन मॉडल जो विक्टोरियन मतलब कॉलोनियलिस्ट जिसको हम कहते हैं जो शासक वर्ग जो था जो ब्रिटिश शासन को ज्यादा बड़ा दिखाता था उस वर्ग को वो रिप्रेजेंट करते थे अब इसी के साथ डार्विन कोई अकेले मतलब वो एवोल्यूशनिस्ट तो थे ही लेकिन उनका वहां विरोध भी हुआ कहाँ कहाँ से विरोध हुआ बिशप विल्बर फोर्स या जिसको हम कहते एक जिसको क्लर्जी हम कहते या चर्च या रिलीजियस कैंप से हुआ बहुत सारी रिलीजन्स इस एवोल्यूशन की थ्योरी में बिलीव नहीं करते वो वो इस चेंज के या कुदरत कुदरत के जो चेंजेस है या इस उत्पत्ति के उसको मानते नहीं है थॉमस हक्सली के साथ उनकी डिबेट बहुत फेमस है और हम ये मानते हैं कि एवोल्यूशनिस्ट शायद जीते हैं लेकिन क्या अभी भी डिबेट्स उसके ऊपर शुरू है और लोग उस पर बात अभी भी कर रहे हैं ये सब सो एंड टू अंडरस्टैंड हाउ हाउ evolution is eventually winning i think it is necessary to to talk about the component that was missing at the time of darwin which is the idea of of genetics which um in fact the work towards it had already been is was being done at the time of darwin uh, so gregor mendel um uh, a, a botanist between 1856 and 63 he cultivated 29000 pea plants plants which produce the vegetable pea um you know uh, green peas um and uh, he he uh, generated and um, what um, he observed was that offspring receive characteristics from both parents but only what he called a dominant dominant characteristic trait is expressed um mendel's work at that time uh, even though he carried out the work from 1856 to 63 people started reading it and debating it only much later about 40 to 50 years later in the 1900s long after his death um because his his work uh, uh, uh contradicted the idea at that time so what he basically did was he took uh, pollen from a male male parent plant uh, of uh, a pea plant and he he uh, he transferred the pollen to the uh, to a female parent pea plant um uh, the flower and he looked at the offspring and he noticed um, uh, that um uh, if if he were to take a, a tall pea plant and a short pea plant and if he were to cross breed them the result would produce all tall pea plants only and no short pea plants but on the other hand if you take those tall pea plants which are produced by cross breeding the tall and short pea plants and you were to self fertilize them so plants can you can take a plants uh, you know uh, pollen from the male uh, flower uh, from the flower of a plant and fertilize itself if you were to fertilize them then you would on average see get three tall plants and one short plant in fact um, uh, in fact um, uh, mendel's exact numbers were 
he he found that in the third generation after self fertilization he saw uh, that he would see 787 tall plants to 277 short plants which is a ratio of 2.84 is to 1 not 3 is to 1 but that is statistically compatible with 3 is to 1 uh this res the result of this experiment which he carried out in a lab uh, contradicted the predominant belief about inheritance at that time which was known as the blending model which if i will explain was that if you take a tall plant and a short plant and you cross them then all the plants would be of medium height. This was the belief at that time. But, um, and if you were to self-fertilize them again, then they would all be again of, of medium height. And this was the belief among bi bi biologists at that time. But Mendel's actual results suggested that if you cross a tall plant and a short plant, you get tall plants always. And if you take these mixed tall plants and you cross them, them uh, with themselves, then you get with the three is to one ratio tall plants and short plants. And um, so it is because he his beliefs contradicted the predominant belief, sorry, his, his experimental results empirically contradicted the predominant beliefs of those time that his results were ignored for almost half a century. And this is also a tendency you see in science today that uh, if people tend to have a lot of uh, uh, belief in one way of thinking, no matter how much real evidence you give them, it takes them a long time to, to, to adapt it. The way of science is, of course, to change your, your opinions, your views, your beliefs according to what experimental evidence shows you, but it takes time, even in the sciences. So I'll let Subodh uh, explain these uh, things, and then uh, uh, we will move on to the next three slides. So Darwin, the uh, uh, weakness was that he genetics, or what we call Jaivik, आधार को उन्होंने उतना उस पर एक्सप्लोर नहीं किया था तो उसको लेकर बहुत बड़ी कड़ी मिलती है हमको जेनेटिक्स को लेकर ग्रेगोर मेंडल के नाम से और यह नहीं कि वो उसके बाद तैयार हुआ जबकि जेनेटिक्स पे काम जरूर चल रहा था मेंडल ने एक उनका एक माना जाता है कि एक बहुत सारा उन्होंने एक्सपेरिमेंट जो किया मूलभूत जिस, जिसकी वजह से हमको यह बात पता चली जेनेटिक्स के बारे में वो था मटर यानी पी प्लांट्स ग्रीन पी जिसको हम कहते मटर की जो पौधे हैं उसको लेकर उन्होंने एक्सपेरिमेंट किया उन्तीस हजार उन्होंने ऐसे प्लांट्स कल्टीवेट किए और उन्होंने ये पाया कि प्लांट्स का जो है उनके साइज के हिसाब से उनका चयन होता है तो टॉल और शॉर्ट यानी लंबाई और जिसको हम कहते हैं बोनाई तो लंबे और बोने प्लांट्स में उन्होंने फर्टिलाइजेशन किया और ये देखा कि जो नया प्लांट जन्म लेता है वो सारे दोनों की करेक्टरिस्टिक्स लेते हैं तो इसमें उन्होंने क्या पाया वो किस तरह पाया तो एक टॉल प्लांट लिया और एक शॉर्ट प्लांट लिया उन दोनों में क्रॉस किया उन दोनों का क्रॉस क्या निकला है एक टॉल यानी कि लंबा प्लांट निकला और इन लंबे प्लांट से वो सेल्फ फर्टिलाइज किया तो एक कुछ जनरेशन के बाद इनमें नेक्स्ट जनरेशन क्या निकलती है तीन तीन प्लांट निकलते हैं टॉल लंबे और एक शॉर्ट निकलता है यानी दोनों जो उनके पेरेंट्स या जिसको बोलते हैं पूर्व पेरेंट्स है उनकी प्रॉपर्टीज उन उसमें आती है अब मेंडल को उस समय कोई तवज्जो नहीं मिली क्यों नहीं मिली क्योंकि उस समय उनके खिलाफ की जो या उनके उस समय जो चलन था वो था ब्लेंडिंग मॉडल का चलन ब्लेंडिंग मॉडल का चलन है हम आज भी मानते हैं कि हम देखते हैं कि एक लंबा है एक बोना है तो वो दोनों के मिलन से मिडल मिडल पैदा होगा तो वो मान मान्यता थी तो उस ब्लेंडिंग मॉडल के आगे इनकी थेरी को कोई सीरियसली नहीं ले रहा था जबकि उन्नीस के बाद उनको ये सीरियसली लिया गया है ये हम देखते हैं ये सब सो मेंडेल प्रपोस्ट बेस्ड ऑन हिज एक्सपेरिमेंट्स अ लॉ ऑफ डोमिनेंस व्हिच इज दैट व्हेन देयर आर टू अल्टरनेटिव फॉर्म्स ऑफ अ पर्टिकुलर ट्रेट फॉर एग्जांपल टॉल वर्सेस शॉर्ट प्रेजेंट इन एन ऑर्गेनिज्म देन वन डोमिनेंट वन अलील विल बी डोमिनेंट ऑन द अदर and the other will be recessive so for example in the first generation uh, no matter how much you cross the tall and uh, the short 
because the tall is dominant the second uh, uh, the, the first generation produced from crossing tall and short will always be tall uh, and the recessive characteristic which is the short one is never expressed um uh, but on the other hand if you were to cross these um uh, tall sh short mixed uh, plants which are tall with themselves then what you get is uh, you get a 3 to 1 ratio because you either get a plant which is uh, consists of both uh, only dominant alleles so uh, or tall um, uh, genes uh, or you get um, plants which are mixed tall and short but because tall is dominant over short the plant is still tall or with a 1 by 4th probability you get a plant which is both which has both the recessive allele uh, so uh, only short uh, the genes for the short plant and as a result, with a 1 by 4 probability, you get a short plant. This was the basic result of Mendel's uh, experiments and which he proposed as his law of dominance. Um, um, and yeah, uh, so I will let uh, Subodh uh, translate that and then we'll move on to the next slide. So Mendel's law per sabse jada parinam, uh, parinam uh, sarup mein kya nikalta hai ki law of, law of dominance ko अधोरेखित करता है लॉ ऑफ डोमिनेंस से ये होता है कि नई जनरेशन में देखिए हम देखते हैं पेरेंट्स एक टॉल है और एक ड्वार्फ है है ना बड़ा टी और छोटा टी लेकिन जो पहली जनरेशन है उन दोनों में कैरेक्टर्स तो दोनों के हैं लेकिन फिजिकली जो रिप्रेजेंट हो रहा है वो टॉल हो रहा है यानी जो डोमिनेंट है वो टॉल है है ना तो ये जो लॉ ऑफ डोमिनेंस है ये हमने देखा है कि जो F2 जनरेशन है सेकंड जनरेशन में हम देखते हैं कि 3 is to 1 में रहता है यानी फिर भी वह हम जिसको बोलते हैं डोमिनेंट है या जिसको जो सबसे ज्यादा प्रभावी है तो मेंडल्स का जो प्रभाव लॉ ऑफ प्रभाव या लॉ ऑफ डोमिनेंस है वो हम देखते हैं कि ये जेनेटिकली जरूर दोनों के दोनों पेरेंट्स के ट्रेट लिया है लेकिन किसका ज्यादा प्रभाव होगा या किसका ज्यादा असर होगा नई जनरेशन पे वो होगा डोमिनेंट जिसको बोलते पेरेंट या डोमिनेंट कैरेक्टर का ये सब नाउ दिस दिस सॉर्ट ऑफ आर्ग्यूमेंट्स डू नॉट कंक्लूसिवली एक्चुअली डिस्प्रूव द ब्लेंडिंग मॉडल द ब्लेंडिंग मॉडल इज ऑफकोर्स क्वाइट अ वेग आइडिया uh, and i will i will be uh, as the stock progresses you will get it a little better for example there are hibiscus plants that you can cross with each other you can take a red hibiscus plant and a white hibiscus plant and if you were to cross them instead of getting always red plant or white plant because one is dominant of the other you will get a pink flower which is uh, actually more consistent with the blending model so uh, so uh, Mendel's idea of genetics is also sort of um, incomplete um, because uh, it it uh, it uh, the the law of dominance did, does not apply universally to every situation. If you were to take the F two generation of uh, pink plants and cross them with each other again, then you will with one by fourth probability get a red flower back again because the the uh, the red uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, it will have both the red alleles, whereas uh, you will get one by two probability a pink plant because uh, they will have both red and white genes. And with one by four probability, you will get a white plant again. What this means is that if you take uh, the F2 generation and cross with it and you produce, let's say, four plants, two out of them will be pink on average, one will be red and one will be white. So this is a case of incomplete dominance and this is not really consistent with Mendel's law of dominance. And you will notice this in biology a lot. What is stated often as a law does not turn out to be exactly correct. It just turns out to be a better way of thinking about the same problem. So I will let uh, Subodh translate that before we move on to the next slide. Yes. Um, yeah. So law of dominance bhi puri tara universal nahi hai. Kyun nahi hai? Kyunki, dekhye, blending model जिसको मान्यता मिली थी उस मेंडल के समय ब्लेंडिंग मॉडल को टोटली निगेट नहीं करते दिख रहा था मेंडल का मॉडल 
क्यों क्योंकि उन्होंने देखा कि अब वाइट हिबिस्कस जिसको हम कहते हैं या रेड हिबिस्कस हिबिस्कस का फ्लावर में ये एक्सपेरिमेंट करके देखा कि रेड हिबिस्कस लिया गया उसको किया गया मेट किया गया वाइट हिबिस्कस से और जो नेक्स्ट जनरेशन निकली वो पिंक कलर की निकली तो ये ब्लेंडिंग मॉडल का एक जीता जागता उदाहरण मिला यानी लॉ ऑफ डोमिनेंस यहाँ काम नहीं कर रहा और फिर इसी को हम आगे देखें तो सेकेंड जनरेशन में जो देखा गया पिंक फ्लावर में जो आपस में वो करवाई गई फर्टिलाइजेशन तो उसमें देखा गया कि चार में से एक अगर चार उसमें से फ्लावर निकले तो चार में से एक रेड निकला था दो पिंक निकले और एक व्हाइट निकला तो हम ये लॉ ऑफ डोमिनेंस यहाँ पर कहीं आके रुक गया हसा हम देखते हैं तो हम किसी भी थ्योरी को पूरी तरह यूनिवर्सलाइज नहीं कर सकते हाँ लेकिन सर कहते कि हाँ सोचने का दर्जा जरूर हमारा बढ़ जाता है उसका व्याप हमारा जरूर बढ़ जाता है ये सर एंड टू एक्चुअली टू एक्चुअली गो डीपर इन दिस एंड अंडरस्टैंड द जेनेटिक बेसिस ऑफ एवोल्यूशन we need to really keep track of the later developments after darwin and mendel which is the idea of uh, of um, of a cell which was uh, discovered by robert hooke in the late 1600s when the microscope was first discovered he took uh, the cork which is you know a tissue from a tree uh, and he placed it under a microscope and he saw that there were cells and this led to what is called the cell theory of biology later on people later on people like lew and hock looked at the cells uh, looked at also animal tissue under microscopes and found that the idea of a cell is fundamental not only to plants but also to animals and the basic anatomy of a cell is something like what we see today uh, different types of cells have uh, you know different kinds of these organisms but there is always a cell um, um, wall and within which there is a jelly like substance known as the uh, cytoplasm uh, and uh, there is um, there is uh, the, each cells have a powerhouse known as a mitochondrion and then there is uh, always a, a nucleus within a cell which in which what we mod today think of as um, uh, as the uh, as the genetic material is contained and uh, after studying uh, for example the cell under a microscope with more advanced techniques people discovered that within the nucleus there is something called a deoxyribonucleic acid it is it has this double helix structure which was uh, the discovery of which was awarded a nobel prize and uh, the structure um, it, it this structure is uh, you know held together by uh, these uh, these chemical base pairs known as adenine thymine guanine cytosine etc and almost all form the important thing about this is that almost all forms of life store their genetic information as dna so these these four uh, chemical base pairs which um, hold the dna together can be thought of as alphabets um, which together encode a, a, a sentence which is written in four alphabets so the same way the english language has 26 alphabets um uh dna the the genetic information that uh, we all carry within us is made up of these four alphabets and uh, you can think of all uh, all genetic information that is stored within the cell as as a sentence is written using these four alphabets and uh, some except so the almost all forms of life except uh, some forms of viruses um uh, store uh, uh, store their genetic information as dna uh the virus is for example store it as a different chemical known as an rna which is very analogous to a dna except that instead of a uh, uh, instead of the chemical known as th thymine it has another chemical known as uracil this causes uh, rna to be less stable than dna as a result it's not if it is not stable what happens is you cannot store the information for long it will change too fast um so i said that the genetic information within each organism is in the form of dna and you can think of each um, uh, you can think of dna as a sentence uh, made up of these four alphabets um so how many alphabets make up uh, the human dna about 3 billion alphabets so if it it's uh, it's four alphabets 3 billion of these put together is the sentence that contain the information about uh, uh, each human being on average the coronavirus which was not a dna virus it's an rna virus 
But like I said, RNA is very analogous to a DNA. It's uh, it is also four alphabets. It's just that one of the alphabets is different. It 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 is just thirty five thousand base pairs. So a human being is three billion base pairs. A, a coronavirus is just thirty five thousand. This is how you uh, how you can compare the two. Um, one of the central ideas of how we think of in molecular biology today is that information is stored in the DNA and then it is transcribed into RNA and then later on proteins, which is what we are all made of, is made from the RNA. This is called the central dogma of molecular biology. And it is with the with this understanding, which has arised in recent years, in fact, in the last 70 years or so, that modern evolution is understood. So I will let, uh, I will let uh, Subodh thanks and then we will uh, move on to the next slide. Yes. So, as we have seen, how the dominate uh, dominate law of dominance ko bhi ek tarah se, uh, wo mila hai, challenge So, we to aur bhitar jate hue hum dekhte hain ki organisms ya individuals ya plants inke sabse nichtam ya sabse sabse chhota uh, element kya hota hai to ye hum dekhte hain ki cell jisko hum kehte hain ab ye cell jo hai ye 1600 the uh, century mein uh, robert hooke uh, robert hooke ne shodh lagaya tha unhone ped ki chhal ko nikal ke usko kyunki tabhi इसको माइक्रोस्कोप का भी शोध लगा था पेड़ की छाल को उन्होंने स्टडी किया था और ये देखा गया कि ये जो बेस है लग सेल का ये लगभग सारे ही ऑर्गेनिजम्स में ये सारे ही जीवों में कॉमन है यानी ये उनका बेस है तो लिविन हॉग जैसे हैं उन्होंने भी देखा कि ये फंडामेंटल एलिमेंट है हर किसी ऑर्गेनिज्म का प्लांट्स हो एनिमल्स हो या कुछ भी तो इसमें देखिए हम भी देख रहे हैं कि इसमें सेल एक वॉल होती है माइटोकॉन्ड्रिया जो है जो जिसको हम पावर हाउस कहते हैं इसका वो होता है प्लाज्मा मेम्ब्रेन होती है साइटोप्लाज्म होता है जिसको लेकर हम बार-बार देखते हैं आपने स्कूल में भी इसके बारे में पढ़ाई की होती अब यहां हम आते हैं नेक्स्ट लेवल पर डीएनए जिसको हम कहते हैं डीऑक्सी राइबो न्यूक्लिक एसिड अब ये ये जो डीएनए है ये एक इसका हम कहेंगे एड्रेस है या एक किस्म का आपका एक जिसको कहते हैं ना एक विशिष्ट डेटा हम कहेंगे अब ये डेटा कैसे है जैसे आपके अल्फाबेट की सीरीज होती है एबीसीडी यहां पर डीएनए जो है ये चार अल्फाबेट की सीरीज है जिसमें इन केमिकल कंपोनेंट का जरूरी शुमारी होती है जो है एडनिन थायमिन ग्वेनिन और साइटोसिन और इसके जो डबल हेलिक स्ट्रक्चर जिसको आप देख रहे हैं जिसमें प्योरीन पिरिमिडीन और ये पूरा जो है इसको नोबेल प्राइस मिला था क्रिक एंड वॉटसन उन्होंने इसका शोध लगाया था और लगभग सभी ऑर्गेनिज्म हम हम जितने भी ऑर्गेनिज्म देखते हैं सभी डीएनए के फॉर्म में ही अपनी जेनेटिक इंफॉर्मेशन यानी अपनी जो जिसको बोलते हैं जेनेटिक कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स को स्टोर करते हैं मेरी जनरेशन में जो मैंने जीन्स अख्तियार की है वो इस फॉर्मेट में ही जिसको कहते छपेंगे या इस फॉर्मेट में हम स्टोर करेंगे अब एक किस्म होता है आरएनए तो आरएनए होता है एक वो जनरली वायरसेस जिसको करते हैं वायरसेस भी ऑर्गेनिज्म होते हैं लेकिन ये थोड़े से कमजोर किस्म के होते हैं क्योंकि इनका ज्यादा ये उतने ठोस नहीं होते और यूर थाइमिन की जगह इनमें यूरेसिल होता है तो हम देखते हैं कि ह्यूमन जीनोम यानी हम लोग हमारे हमारे डीएनए में किस कितने किस्म की इंफॉर्मेशन होगी या कितने किस्म के सेंटेंसेस होंगे है ना तो हम देखते हैं कि 3 बिलियन बेस पेयर्स हमारे बॉडी में है और जो हाल ही में हमको परेशान करके गया जो वायरस है उसमें पैंतीस हजार बेस पेयर्स रहे रहे हैं आरएनए के है ना आरएनए और डीएनए ये दोनों कंपोनेंट्स हैं जहां इंफॉर्मेशन या जेनेटिक इंफॉर्मेशन स्टोर होती है और सेंट्रल डॉगमा या जिसको कहेंगे एक अपनी रिलीजियस इसमें कहते हैं कि एक पत्थर की लकीर या जिसको हम बोलते हैं ना मान्यता है वो है कि 
ये जो प्रोटीन का संचालन होता है डीएनए टू आर एन ए आर एन ए टू प्रोटीन ये मॉलिकुलर बायोलॉजी का एक सेंट्रल डॉगमा हम देखते हैं जिसपे हम सर हम बात करेंगे इस सर so so the mechanism of evolution can now be understood in terms of 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 genetics which is there is something called the genotype which is all the information that's stored in your in your dna and then there is your phenotype which is actually you know what what you actually turn out to be as an organism so your hair color your eye color your um, your skin color all of this is uh, is how is is in some sense believed to be stored within your genes so uh, what you actually look like is uh, your actual tr characteristic traits that's called your phenotype and what is encoded the information about it that is encoded in your dna that is called your genotype and what happens is um uh, genetic information changes uh, through the process when cells multiply when new cells are born because organisms grow or when organisms reproduce and uh, when they uh, due to recombination of the dna the dna from different organisms mixing due to sexual reproduction the dna changes and but mutations are when random errors uh, also pile up within the within the dna so this you can think of as there is either deletion which is like if you have a sentence of these uh, a t c g uh, in a specific order and some part of it gets deleted you could have duplication where some part of it accidentally gets copied twice so you know you you see these sort of mistakes in whenever you send messages to each other if you if you send messages to somebody on whatsapp you quite often see that sometimes a character is missing sometimes something is typed twice sometimes of course nobody does an inversion while sending a message but this is a this is an error that can quite often happen when 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 your dna is being uh, uh, being copied uh, and uh, the reason for this is that um, either uh, radiation so if if you have ionizing radiation high energy particles hitting uh, the molecules of dna then the bonds break and errors can uh, happen Yeah, or it could be because of a virus is attacking you. So, in the case of, for example, um, uh, many cancers which are caused by viruses, what is happening is a virus goes in and it changes your DNA a little bit, and that causes a mutation. Um, and quite often, what happens is that because a mutation changes your genotype, it can also change the phenotype. For example, um, you can take um, a red-eyed wild type fruit fly, uh, which is what is normally seen. and then you can uh, in a lab introduce a mutation in its genotype and it will uh, and in the next generation you will see that it has a white eye you can you can actually do this as an experiment this has been demonstrated so mutations of this kind where the dna changes are quite rare because because you know dna is very stable the the previous structure it is uh, it uh, uh, the structure is such that the two strands are uh, are checks and balances on each other each base pair is complementary to another base pair so um, uh, mutations are rather rare on the dna uh, but uh, they lead to variation of the kind that i i mentioned and um, uh, quite often mutations can be damaging because the probability life is very complex and you need uh, you know you can again think of it in terms of uh, of meaningful sentences uh, if you want to say something let's say Uh, this slide is mostly white in color that sentence is a very specific combination of alphabets but if you change any alphabet the sentence becomes wrong and so the probability of getting a right sentence is uh, through mutations is much smaller than the probability of getting wrong sentences and similarly you have similar effects also in genetics so mutations quite often have damaging effects and so organisms have enzymes whose job it is to compare the the two separate strands of a dna check for errors and fix the errors etc but basically genetic variation the information at the level of dna changing due to processes such as sexual reproduction or mutation is how you get variability so darwin could not explain why there was variability between different uh, uh, organisms of of the same generation within a species but today thanks to our understanding of genetics we we have an explanation for this in terms of mutation and and um, and genes uh, and the dna mixing 
due to sexual reproduction. So um, I will let uh, Subodh uh, translate this before I move on to the next slide. Yes. So uh, evolution ya utkranti ka ye jo mechanism hai, to ham ab tak jis tarah se aage hai, usme ham dekhte hain ki ab isme do kisam ki जिसको हम कहते हैं ना दो दो डायमेंशन में हम देखते हैं एक होता है जीनोटाइप जो कि अपेरेंस में नहीं है जो इनहेरिटेड है या जो इनफॉर्मे इंफॉर्मेशन जो है उस फॉर्म में है जिसको हम हमने देखा है कि डीएनए का फॉर्म या जीन्स का फॉर्म हमने देखा लेकिन जो बाहरी अपेरियंस है जो एनवायरमेंट जिस वजह से वो उस जीनो टाइप को एनवायरमेंट मिलने की वजह से एक बाहरी रूप आया है कुछ कैरेक्टरिस्टिक उसमें आए हैं उसको हम कहते हैं फिनोटाइप अब इन जीनोटाइप और फिनोटाइप की जो जिसको कहते हैं ना इस भाग में हम नेक्स्ट लेवल देखते हैं कि जेनेटिक म्यूटेशन म्यूटेशन का मतलब है चेंजेस या जिसको हम कहते हैं अगर किसी डीएनए या अगर किसी जीन्स में आ, कुछ किस्म की कमियां रह जाए या कोई रिपीटेशन हो जाए जैसे हमने वो देखा है अल्फाबेट कौन से कौन से थे ए कौन से ए टी सी जी ये सब आई हैव इट ए टी सी जी में अगर रिपीटेशन हो जाए या कुछ मिस हो जाए उस वजह से म्यूटेशन आता है म्यूटेशन मतलब चेंजेस आना या किसी किस्म की रुकावट या किसी किस्म का बदलाव आना उसको म्यूटेशन कहते अब म्यूटेशन के टाइप्स यहाँ पे दिए हैं अलग अलग किस्म के म्यूटेशन होते हैं डिलीशन डुप्लीकेशन इन्वर्जन इंसर्शन ये आ, कभी कभी आ, जिसको हम कहते हैं ना किसी किसी वजह से आ, कोई कोई जो एक्सटर्नल इम्पैक्ट की वजह से भी म्यूटेशन होते हैं जैसे रेडिएशन हो गया या किसी वायरस का आना बॉडी में और उस वायरस के द्वारा डीएनए में जाकर कुछ चेंजेस लाना उस वजह से भी होता है कार्सिनोजिन यानी जिसको हम कैंसरस एक कहते हैं उस वजह से भी ये चेंजेस आते हैं म्यूटेशन देखा जाता है कि म्यूटेशन जो है वो कम होते हैं हम जैसे हम देखते हैं कि हम जनरली बात सीधे करते हैं लेकिन एक हाथ बार हमारे से कुछ गलती हो जाती है लेकिन जो म्यूटेशन होते हैं वो मेन जो इन्फॉर्म्ड स्टोरेज है या मेन जो डी या मेन जीनेटिक जो बेस होता है उसमें जरूर कुछ ना कुछ डैमेज करता है डैमेजिंग इफेक्ट रखता है लेकिन ऑर्गेनिज्म में ऐसी भी कैपेसिटी होती है देखिए एवोल्यूशन का ये भी एक भाग है कि ऑर्गेनिज्म में ये भी एक कैपेसिटी है कि वो ऐसे एंजाइम्स या एक किस्म के ऐसे माइक्रोब्स अपने अंदर पनप पनपती है उनके अंदर जो इन फॉल्टी डीएनए को रिपेयर करते हैं है ना इन फॉल्टी डीएनए को रिपेयर करते हैं इसके अलावा जो सेक्सुअल रिप्रोडक्शन होता है दो अलग व्यक्तियों में जब साथ आते हैं तो जो सेक्सुअल रिप्रोडक्शन होता है तो उससे जेनेटिक रिकॉम्बिनेशन भी होता है वो भी एक किस्म का म्यूटेशन ही कहलाता है तो एक एग्जांपल हमने देखा कि म्यूटेंट फ्रूट फ्रूट फ्लाई जो सर ने बताया कि उनमें एक चेंजेस ला उनकी आंख का कलर हमने सफेद करके दिखाई है सर सो so genetic changes arising from either mutation or from sexual reproduction uh, so genetic recombination due to uh, sexual reproduction lead to variations so what darwin couldn't explain is now explained from this understanding um some of these mutations will persist and lead to increasing genetic variation within a population for example um variations of a particular genes are known as alleles and for example eye color you know that among human beings you have brown eyes you have blue eyes you have green eyes and uh, also hair color you have black eyes you have you have uh, you know uh, sorry black hair you have blonde hair etc um, and also skin color these are all uh, variations due to uh, uh, in the history of human beings uh, 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 mutations happening and what happens is that um, these uh, these changes due to mutations get immediately selected for or against uh, due to the out, outside environment for example um, people prefer uh, not just human beings but also animals might uh, prefer their sex partners to have uh, taller partners 
or stronger partners. And as a result, any mutation that leads to somebody being taller or fairer or um, uh, or having specific hair colors, et cetera, get selected for in the population, people with those variations are able to find mates uh, easier and have, have uh, offspring, uh, more offspring than others. And as a result, these variations propagate. Um, and um, if on the other hand, if any of these changes uh, uh, introduce a harmful effect, for example, in, among human beings, some of these mutations can cause diseases such as uh, uh, such as uh, the ability for your blood to not clot, etc. These can severely affect your ability to live long and reproduce. And as a result, the ones that cause, uh, cause you to be less fit to reproduce, uh, you are less likely to reproduce and then you will get removed from the population. So mutations that lead to favorable outcomes to the rest of society preferring you that lead you to live longer and reproduce, these mutations will come to dominate and it will come to be there in throughout society. Whereas mutations that cause diseases, which reduce your life expectancy, they are slowly eliminated from the population. Um, in the contrast, uh, so, so this is how uh, evolutionary change happens um, over longer time scales. Um, uh, so um, I will let Subodh explain this before we, we consider a particular example which was uh, described by JBS Haldane. So. so, इसी uh, mutation को ही हम देखते हैं कि जब genetic combination हुए हैं लोगों का मिलना हुआ है, तो अलग-अलग किस्म के लोग मिले हैं यहाँ पे. लेकिन इसमें हम देखते हैं mutation का एक बहुत बड़ा चिन्ह है या representation है वो variation है. अलग-अलग लोग एक ही समझो विभाग से भी होंगे लेकिन उनमें हमने देखा है वेरिएशन हुआ है तो ये जो म्यूटेशन है जेनेटिक वेरिएशन के नाम पे ये हमने जरूर देखा है अब इन वेरिएंट्स जो है एक समझो एक हमने विशिष्ट वेरिएशन पाया जिसकी वजह से वो व्यक्ति या वो वो अलग उसमें वो प्रॉपर्टी है उस उस वेरिएंट्स को बोला जाता है एलीज अब ये म्यूटेंट एलीज जो होते हैं ये सेक्सुअल रिप्रोडक्शन के द्वारा ही दूसरी जनरेशन में जाते हैं तो जैसे मोस्टली लोग देखते हैं कि वही जो इफेक्ट है जो पहले का हमने देखा डोमिनेंट वाला जो कि अपने पार्टनर्स को वो देखते हैं कि वो एक स्ट्रोंगर पार्टनर होगा या ऊंचा या टॉल होगा या एक किस्म से उनकी स्किन टोन एक किस्म की होगी तो ऐसा माना जाता है कि उन उनसे उनके ये एलिल्स जो है ये नेक्स्ट जनरेशन में ट्रांसफर होंगे है ना तो ये म्यूटेंट एलिल्स जो है ये वेरिएंट्स जो है वो नेक्स्ट जनरेशन में स्प्रेड होंगे लेकिन ऐसे कुछ एलिल्स है या ऐसे कुछ वेरिएंट्स है जो मे बी बीमारी फैलाते होंगे या उस वजह से एक किस्म की इनेबिलिटी आती है तो ये धीरे धीरे क्या हो जाता है ये स्प्रेड ना होता है ये उल्टा आ, कम होते जाते हैं यानी वो अली वो वेरिएंट जो आ, आ, एक किस्म से बीमारी को इनवाइट करता है वो धीरे धीरे हटता जाता है पॉपुलेशन से और जो म्यूटेंट जो ज्यादा स्ट्रांग है जो ज्यादा अच्छा है वो हटता जाता है और इसलिए फेवरेबल जो वेरिएंट है वो अपने आप आ, Preferably, या जिसको बोलते ना मुख्य रूप से वो पास होता है और जो बीमारी पैदा करने वाली वेरिएंट है तो वो अपने आप उस पॉपुलेशन से धीरे धीरे कम हो जाती है सर सो एन एग्जांपल ऑफ दिस वाज लेड आउट बाय दिस एवोल्यूशनरी बायोलॉजिस्ट जेबीएस हॉल्डेन हुज एक्चुअली एन इंटरेस्टिंग कैरेक्टर ही वॉज ब्रिटिश ऑरिजिन बट ही मूव टू इंडिया एंड बिकेम एन इंडियन सिटीजन बिकॉज he was he was a communist and he was against uh, the imperialist policies of both the uk and the soviet union and he lived in the indian statistical institute in kolkata and that's where uh, he lived till his death um the example he uh, he presented is uh, of uh, the 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 moth uh, the moth is an uh, is this fly which uh, has a pattern which allows it to be camouflaged against uh, uh, you know the kind of trees it sits on and um, uh, uh, what was found was that before the industrial revolution the moth pre predominantly had this color and it would sit on trees and it was camouflaged and uh, uh, as a result any predator that was trying to attack that moth could not see it 
But during the Industrial Revolution, as in the UK in particular, what happened was um, there was a lot of pollution. The kind of bad pollution we are seeing in India, this happened in the UK, in London, etc. In the in the eighteen hundreds uh, and late um, uh, early nineteen hundreds, etc. It was way more polluted in those times than. And then they brought in more pollution control measures and reduced the pollution. And so what happened was during the Industrial Revolution, the uh, trees, barks, etc. were covered in soot and they became black in color. And as a result, what happened was moths like this uh, started disappearing and the moths became all black in color. And this was because um, uh, there was relative variation among the moths in how, how much patches of black and white there are due to the mechanisms explained uh, earlier. But uh, because this also allows the moths to camouflage itself against a predator, a predator is less likely to see a moth that is uh, uh, peppered like this if the tree has a similar structure. Whereas uh, if the tree is black in color, the predator is less likely to see a, a, a moth that is fully black in color. So during the Industrial Revolution, these kind of moths so slowly disappeared and it became purely these sort of moths. And then once again, after uh, London introduced pollution control measures and the air quality improved and the trees went back to being naturally colored, etc., the moths, you know, nowadays, if you go to London, you will see moths of this color again. And this is, uh, this has been uh, recorded throughout history. People who collect samples of moths have maintained records of how many uh, color moths of different colors could be found in through different periods of history and the frequency of Moths of the different types of patterning uh, strongly suggests uh, that this sort of natural selection is happening in nature, even as we observe. And this was uh, this was suggested by Holday. So, जैसे आप देखते हैं JBS Holden के इस experiments या उनके एक शोध से ये natural selection जो है ये action में दिखती है ना कुदरत अपनी तरह से किस तरह अपने ऑर्गेनिजम्स अपने चेंज लाते हैं तो पेपर्ड मॉथ का एक एग्जांपल जेबीएस हल्देन जिन्होंने डिस्कवर किया जेबीएस हल्देन हल्देन जैसे सर ने बताया कि आ, वे भारत में सेटल हो गए थे और बहुत आ, इनका आ, काम रहा है और आ, भारत में इंडियन स्टैटिस्टिकल इंस्टीट्यूट में ही वे रहे तो इनका एक शोध रहा है वो ये रहा कि इंडस्ट्रियल रेवल्यूशन के दौरान जब पेड़ों पर ये मौत ये जो आप देख रहे हैं मौत रहते थे तो ये ऊपर का जो पेल कलर था उस उस कलर की हुआ करते थे लेकिन बिकॉज ऑफ इंडस्ट्रियल रेवल्यूशन जो पोल्यूशन हुआ उसमें पेड़ों के ऊपर जहां वो रहते थे वो सूट कवर यानी जो काली जो परत होती है जो हम जैसे मोमबत्ती या किसी धूप अगरबत्ती से जो निकाली परत बनती ऐसी परतें उन पेड़ों पे हुई तो उस वजह से क्या हुआ ये जो पेड़ों की छाल जैसा जो इनका रंग होता है वो पेड़ काले होने से वो दिखने लग जाते हैं और इनको जो मारने वाला या इनको जो खाने वाला कोई भी ऑर्गेनिज्म होगा वो इनको अटैक कर सकता है तो इन्होंने अपने आप में ये नेचुरल रिलेक्शन विकसित किया जिससे इन्होंने उस सूत का कलर ही जो काला कलर है या डार्क कलर है वो एलील जो है या वो वेरिएंट जो है वो खुद ही उन्होंने अडेप्ट किया ठीक है तो ये हम देखते हैं जो नेक्स्ट जो फोटो है उसमें हम देखते हैं ये ब्लैक कलर का या काले कलर का मौत उन्होंने बिकॉज ऑफ इस इस सूत कवर्ड ट्री पर अपने आप को छुपाने के लिए अपने आप को उसका और अपने ऊपर हुए अटैक से बचाने के लिए उन्होंने ये विकसित अब हम देखते हैं जब लंदन में और वहां पर पॉल्यूशन कंट्रोल हुआ जब यहाँ इंडस्ट्रीज दूर ले जाई गई और यहाँ के पेड़ों को जो है अच्छा वातावरण मिलने लगा तो हमने देखा है कि इन मॉच ने फिर से अपना ये पुराना रंग वापस से अडेप्ट कर लिया है वापस से नेचुरल सिलेक्शन कर लिया है क्यों क्योंकि वहां पर इस किस्म का अब पोल्यूशन नहीं है और पेड़ों की छाल का ही वो कलर हमसे दिखता है तो ये बेस्ट एग्जांपल हम हमारे सामने आता है सब सो द डॉग इज फॉर एग्जांपल अनदर एग्जांपल ऑफ हाउ सेलेक्शन कैन चेंज द फ्रीक्वेंसी ऑफ एलिल्स इन अ पॉपुलेशन बट दिस इज नॉट अ केस ऑफ नेचुरल सेलेक्शन बिकॉज वी ह्यूमन बींग्स डिड दिस अबाउट फोर्टी थाउजेंड ईयर्स अगो वी वी टूक वुल्व एंड वी डोमेस्टिकेटेड दम 
and we modified their behavior and depending upon what kind of behavior we wanted, we took different kinds of, of these domesticated wolves and we bred them with each other, etc. And we created the dog. So it is an artificially selected for to have the kind of characteristics we want. But all breeds of dog today belong to the same species, the same species as the wolf, Canis lupus. But some people will say it's a different species, Canis domesticus. And I will come to that later. So this is an example of what is called microevolution, where characteristic change, uh, uh, characteristics have changed. None of these dogs look like a wolf anymore. In fact, maybe the first dog looks like a wolf, but all the other breeds look very different due to human beings breeding them until these characteristics were obtained. But they still remain the same species in the sense that they can still breed with, uh, with the original wolf. Um, and so this is what is called a case of microevolution. तो ये सब तो यहाँ हम और एक एग्जांपल देखते हैं इस किस्म के सिलेक्शन का जिसमें डॉग्स जिसको हम कहते हैं ये इसमें हम देखते हैं इतना वेरिएंट है इतने ज़्यादा वेरिएंट है जो हम ये एक दूसरे से भी मैच नहीं करते जबकि इनका कॉमन एंसेस्टर रहा है कैनेस लुपस तो ये अभी इनको हम कहते हैं कि य आर्टिफिशियली सिलेक्ट करवाइए ये देखिए ये इंसान ने करवाइए किसी नेचुरल सिलेक्शन का हिस्सा नहीं है फिर भी ये बहुत अच्छा एग्जांपल है ये स्टडी करने के लिए कि एक ही स्पीशीज जो है उसमें इतने सारे वेरिएंट होते हैं एलिल्स हो सकते हैं ठीक है अब इस पर बहुत सारा डिबेट है कि कुछ लोग कहते हैं ये कैनिस लुपिस जो है इसी का इसी स्पीशीज के ये सारे डॉग्स होते हैं लेकिन बहुत लोग बोलते हैं कि नहीं ये अलग कैनिस डोमेस्टिकस बोल के एक अलग ही ब्रीड है लेकिन हम जो यहाँ बोल रहे हैं कि एक माइक्रो एवोल्यूशन है क्योंकि माइक्रो एवोल्यूशन मतलब इसमें कोई नई स्पीशीज या नए प्रजाति का जन्म नहीं हुआ उसी एक प्रजाति में ये अलग अलग वेरिएंट्स हम देख रहे हैं जो कि एक ही कैनिस लुपस यानी जो वुल्फ जिसको हम कहते हैं उससे ही ये उत्पत्त हुए हैं ये सर so, um, but if two populations of a species so were to become isolated from one another for tens of thousands of years, uh, then the mutations that happen in these two different populations that don't mix with each other might uh, and the changes might become so significant that they will not be able to mix with each other later on. So, okay, so if the two populations can no longer interbreed, then a new species is believed to have born. This is called macroevolution. So the, the finches and the to tortoises that uh, Darwin saw in different islands of Galapagos, uh, those uh, are an example of macroevolution uh, macro evolution because uh, the finches are not really birds that are capable of flying from one island to another. So as the island separated out over tens of thousands of years, these, these populations stopped being able to mix with each other. And the internal genetic variation took different paths in such a way that they became different species, right? So when, when a new species is formed, it is called macroevolution. And the, the process by which a new species is formed is called speciation. So uh, for, uh, and there is an example of what is called speciation happening uh, again within uh, among human beings, uh, within human history. For example, the mosquito, was introduced to the London underground while it was being constructed during the 1900s. And um, during the World War World War II, it became infamous for attacking people who were, you know, uh, sheltering in the underground from the German bombings. Uh, but the thing was the mosquitoes that were introduced to the underground, they live off biting the human beings in the underground. They never escape the underground and go out into the open air. Uh, very rarely does that happen. Um, and today, it suggests that they have uh, they have become a distinct species. They are no longer able to crossbreed with mosquitoes that live above ground. And interbreeding between populations is is actually difficult, even if you enable this, because the, the the genetics are too different. And so, speciation is occurring in front of our eyes or uh, in, in within recorded human history. Uh, so, I will I will let uh, uh, Subodh translate these two slides. Before I move on to the next slide. So, as we have seen that 
डॉग्स जो है माइक्रो एवोल्यूशन का एक बहुत बड़ा एग्जाम्पल है कि कोई नई स्पीशीज तैयार जरूर नहीं हुई है और उनमें इंटरब्रीडिंग भी पॉसिबल है लेकिन एक ही ब्रीड या एक ही ऑर्गेनाइजेशन जो बहुत सालों से या हजारों सालों से अलग ब्रीड हुई है जैसे गैलापैगस फिंचिस मैंने देखा ये अलग अलग जगह पे ये लोग अपने एनवायरमेंट में पूरे खुल मिल गए हैं और अपनी ही तरह से इन्होंने अपना एवोल्यूशन अपनी एक रास्ता तय किया है अब इनमें इंटरब्रीडिंग पॉसिबल नहीं है ये लोग आपस में मेट नहीं कर सकते इन सब की अपनी अपनी प्रॉपर्टीज अलग हो चुकी है जबकि शायद सेम ही उनका एंसेस्टर रहा होगा तो क्योंकि ये दो नई स्पीसीज तैयार हुई है इसलिए हम इसको मैक्रो एवोल्यूशन कहते हैं मैक्रो एवोल्यूशन और इस पूरी प्रोसेस को कहा जाता है स्पीसीएसन यानी प्रजातिकरण जिसको हम कहते हैं तो इसका एक एग्जाम्पल देखेंगे कि लंडर अंडरग्राउंड जो वॉर के समय लंडर अंडरग्राउंड में मॉस्किटो इंट्रोड्यूस किए गए थे लंडर अंडरग्राउंड में तो उस समय क्या हुआ था कि वॉर जो वॉर के समय में जो वहां पर छुप जाते थे लोग जो तो उन पर अटैक करने के लिए ये मॉस्किटो वहां छोड़े गए थे तो अब ये हाल हुआ है कि वो मॉस्किटो जो अंडरग्राउंड में रहे हैं वो मॉस्किटोज और जो सड़कों पे और नॉर्मल ग्राउंड पर रहने वाले उन मॉस्किटोज में इतने सालों का जो डिफरेंस है लगभग सौ सालों का जो ये डिफरेंस है उस वजह से ऐसा उनमें चेंज आया है कि ये टोटली न्यू स्पीशीज ही तैयार हो गई है और ये आपस में भी ब्रीड नहीं कर पाती है ना तो ये टोटली न्यू स्पीशीज तैयार हमने करवा दी है क्योंकि हमने उनको नीचे भेज दिया और जो कि अगर इनमें से कोई ऊपर आ भी जाता है हवा में तो ये इंटरब्रीड नहीं कर पाता है और ये बहुत ज्यादा डिफिकल्ट है अगर इंटरब्रीड हम करवाने की कोशिश भी करेंगे तो हम आ, तो हम ये कह सकते कि ये स्पीशियशन एक किस्म से हो रहा है लंडन अंडरग्राउंड मॉस्किटो नाम से एक नई स्पीशीज तैयार हुई है सर so this means uh, i'm now ready to kind of discuss the idea of 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 a gene and also an idea of what is a species these are these are quite complex in the sense that it's a somewhat vague idea there is no exact definition for what a gene is that everybody agrees on or what a species is you can think of a gene as a basic unit of her- heredity so if i i i today understood to be a section of dna which codes for a protein so for we are all made up of proteins and i i, I said that uh, parts of the sentence which is written down as as dna gets transcribed into rna and then the rna gets turned into uh, into into a protein and this is how the parts of the body are made by the uh, by the body uh, so a, a stretch of of this long 3 billion base pair long sentence which is what a human beings dna is which encodes for a specific protein you can think of that as a gene okay but this this uh, is uh, kind of complicated because only of the 3 billion pairs only less than 2 percentage of the sections of that are actually encoding for proteins within human be- beings in bacteria for example this can be much larger can be more than 80% of the uh, uh, of the total length of can be encoding for protein but the remaining part the one that is not encoding for protein for a long time it was believed to be junk in that it was just useless information that was there that serves no purpose but it is not actually so trivial there is an entire new field called epigenetics which talks about how this parts of of the of the dna that do not code for proteins under normal circumstances sometimes get activated etc and they also play a role for example recently it has been shown that if if you send somebody to space like the people who go to the international space station and they spend a few hundred days there when they come back some of their junk dna gets activated and it is starting to play a role in 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 coding for proteins so this is a concept of a gene uh, which uh, you know at the time of uh, the idea of a gene was first introduced by mendel but at that time the dna was not really understood its structure was not understood it's the how information is stored in it was not understood it was believed to be just a unit of hereditary information uh, which had all of these alleles and uh, properties but today uh, we understand that uh, genes 
are contained within DNA. But even then, what exactly, which part of a gene of DNA is a gene that is not really understood. It is the concept of a gene is something that is continuously evolving, even as our understanding of evolution and of, of, of genetics and of biology improves. Okay. And this is similar with the concept of a species. So if you look up what does a species mean, you will say they will say the largest group of organisms in which any two individuals of the appropriate sexes or mating types can produce fertile offspring, typically by sexual reproduction, is called a species. This is a classification definition, but this is not so trivial. Are dogs and wolves the same species? Some people will say they are dogs are canis domesticus, wolves are canis lupus, they are different species. But some people will say, you know, you can interbreed them. You can take a wolf today from the wild. You can breed them with a dog and you will get an offspring. So they are not different species. They're the same species. Uh, the difference is, of course, that uh, certain types of dogs uh, with each other uh, or with wolves, if you breed them, the, the offspring you get will be very unhealthy. It will be very unviable. It will need a lot of support to live. So always you can think of speciation as gradually happening in this process you can also ask the question are lions and tigers different species or same species because you know if you google uh, the term liger uh, you will see that this animal exists you can have a male tiger mate with uh, 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 sorry a male lion mate with a female tiger and you will get an offspring but that offspring itself is, has quite often a lot of difficulty reproducing so if you if you now introduce the definition that for something to be uh, considered a dif distinct species, not only should they be able to reproduce, but the offspring should also be able to reproduce, then lions and tigers are different species. If on the other hand, if, if your definition is loose, that only they need to be uh, able to reproduce once uh, and the offspring need not be able to reproduce, then the definition is could be that lions and tigers are considered the same species. And even if you introduce these rigorous criteria, you're going to find corner cases. For example, in the Moscow Zoo in uh, 2021, I re if I remember correctly in the news, they were able to breed a second generation. Um, they were able to breed a liger with a tiger and get a second generation liger, which they called a lie liger. Now that would suggest that even with a very rigorous definition of species, that even the second generation offspring should be able to reproduce uh, uh, lions and tigers should be considered one species. Another thing that you might want to uh, uh, consider is uh, one of the things that was given the Nobel Prize in uh, in physical in you know uh, in medical science into uh, uh, or biological science in 2022 was uh, the idea that human beings there were earlier other human species. There were not just human beings, but there were also Neanderthals. And but the two of them intermixed, and almost all of us, except uh, those who can, except human beings who are found uh, in Africa, contain uh, genes from also Neanderthals. Does this mean that Neanderthals were a different species? Does this support the idea? The way to understand this, and I've had this conversation with many biologists, is that the idea of a species is a vague idea, just like the idea of a gene. The 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 it is. It captures your opinion about the current state of a complex ongoing process. Speciation is a very complex process where the offspring become less and less viable, less and less capable of surviving. And um, you are only capturing or trying to add definitions to, an to stages in the intermediate. Some things that you think of as different species may turn out to be one species. Some things that you think of as one species may turn out to be different species. And this is, it is a vague developing idea that improves as our understanding of biology improves. So this is a key concept about both the no notion of genes and the notion of species that I want you all to appreciate in the sense that unlike in fields like mathematics or physics, there are no strict rigorous definitions for these concepts. They are evolving ideas that capture essential notions in biology, which are not amenable to reductionism. There are no strict Re reductive definitions for what a gene is or what a species is. And so Darwin's ideas about evolution with also Mendel's ideas of genetics combined with a modern understanding of how we inherit things through genes with a continuous understanding of, you know, what this non-coding DNA, the 98% of the 
DNA within our human body, which doesn't seem to produce proteins, but they probably still serve a function because you, if you remove that material, a human being will not be able to live. Or if you remove it from a, from a zygote, which is just fertilized, it will not develop into a human being. So our understanding of DNA is less uh, is not as uh, developed as it should be. We do not have a perfect understanding. And as this understanding improves, our understanding of both a concept of the gene and that of a concept of the species improves. And there are no strict definitions for these concepts. This, this is something I wish to convey through this lecture. Yes. So, uh... हम आते हैं कि अभी तक हमने जिस तरह से डिस्कस किया तो उसमें टू बड़े दो बड़े कंपोनेंट हमने डिस्कस किए जिसमें एक आता है जीन जो कि जो कि एड्रेस है या एक जिसको बोलते हैं हमारी एक आ, 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 हमारी हमारे होने का या हमारे एक अस्तित्व का एक वहां पर एड्रेस है या इंफॉर्मेशन है जो पास ऑन हो रहा है और जिसको Uh, एक बेसिक यूनिट ऑफ हेरिडिटी जिसको कहते हैं हेरिडिटी मतलब अनुवांशिकता का एक बेसिक यूनिट माना जाता है क्लासिकल डेफिनेशन में लेकिन ये भी देखा गया है कि एक डीएनए का ये केवल एक सेक्शन है जो प्रोटीन के लिए कोड करता है कोड करना मतलब जैसे हम प्रोग्रामिंग में कोडिंग करते हैं इसी तरह हमारे लिए भी डीएनए का ये सेक्शन कोड करता है लेकिन ये देखा गया कि केवल दो प्रतिशत ही डीएनए जो है वो कोडिंग के काम कर रहे हैं लेकिन एक बैक्टीरिया हम देखते हैं कि अस्सी प्रतिशत से ज्यादा उसका जो है डीएनए ये कोडिंग के लिए उनकी लाइफ के या उनके एक लाइफ इंफॉर्मेशन को कोड करने के काम आता है और बाकी के जो हमारे बचे हुए है पोर्शन है डीएनए के उसको जंग कहा जाता है लेकिन ये देखा गया कि एपिजेनेटिक्स uh, एक नई स्टडी uh, जात हुई है जिसमें इस किस्म के uh, कुछ uh, जो ऐसा पोर्शन जिसने जिसने कोडिंग नहीं की है हमारी इंफॉर्मेशन उस पोर्शन ने भी एक्टिवेट होना शुरू किया है और कई कई एग्जांपल हम देखते हैं एपिजेनेटिक्स में कि वो एक्टिवेट होकर इंफॉर्मेशन स्टोर करना शुरू कर रहे हैं तो इस बारे में भी आप देख सकते हैं यहाँ पर एक लिंक दी हुई है तो डीएनए की तरह डीएनए का जो हर पोर्शन जो है वो जरूरी नहीं कि काम का ना हो एपिजेनेटिक्स के माध्यम से हम देख रहे हैं कि जो पोर्शन स्टोर नहीं भी कर रहा है वो बाद में एक्टिवेट कहीं ना कहीं किसी पर्पज से जरूर हो रहा है इसी तरह हम दूसरे मुद्दे पे आते हैं जो है स्पीशीज यानी प्रजाति तो प्रजातिकरण की जैसे आपने देखी कि क्लासिकल डेफिनेशन है कि अप्रोप्रिएट दो इंडिविजुअल है अपने अपने सेक्सुअली uh, uh, अलग है और एक दूसरे को सेक्सुअली रिप्रोड्यूस प्रोडक्शन में वो भाग ले रहे हैं और एक नई फर्टाइल ऑफ स्प्रिंग वो तैयार कर रहे हैं तो ये तो स्पीशीज का अपना एक uh, जिसको कहते हैं एक डेफिनेशन है लेकिन स्पीशीज में भी जो क्वेश्चंस आ रहे हैं प्रजातियों में भी जो क्वेश्चन आ रहे हैं कि क्या uh, जैसे सर ने कहा कि डॉग्स और वुल्फ्स ये जो है क्या ये एक स्पीशीज है हमने देखा माइक्रो एवोल्यूशन के ऑर्गेनिज एग्जांपल में है डॉग्स और वुल्फ्स को एक ही हमने देखा है तो लेकिन ये भी देखा गया कि जब डॉग और वुल्फ्स जो एक वुल्फ है फुल्ली जिसको बोलते हैं ना जो वुल्फ के फिजिकल uh, एट्रीब्यूट्स uh, में है और डॉग है अभी के अगर हम इनमें मेटिंग कराते हैं तो मे भी जो नया ऑफ स्प्रिंग तैयार होगा मे भी वो ज्यादा हेल्दी uh, ना हो या मे बी वो उस तरीके का वो ना मे बी वो हेल्दी निकले तो हम ये भी नहीं बोल सकते हैं कि ये uh, uh, ये स्पीशीज है एक ही स्पीशीज है लेकिन क्या ये uh, वैसी स्पीशीज है जो इस स्पेशिएशन के uh, मुद्दे को ही uh, शायद चैलेंज कर रही है अब लायन और टाइगर का एग्जाम्पल दिया सर ने अब इनमें मेटिंग हुई है लाइगर जैसा एक एनिमल हमने देखा है या टाइगोन जैसा एनिमल देखा है जो इन दोनों के मेटिंग से पैदा हुए लेकिन ये देखा है कि लाइगर या टाइगन जो है ये अपनी नेक्स्ट स्पीशीज जनरेट नहीं कर पा रहे तो ये एक बाधक है स्पीशिएशन का दूसरा एक देखा कि ह्यूमन और नियंत्रण ये भी देखा गया कि किसी किसी हमारे ही 
ह्यूमंस में कुछ कुछ में नियंडरथल्स के भी कुछ एट्रीब्यूट्स uh, पाए गए तो क्या हम ये माने कि नियंडरथल्स और ह्यूमंस ये जो अलग अलग स्पीशीज है इन्होंने एक नई स्पीशिएशन uh, इजाद uh, दिलाई है तो ये काफी सवाल है और स्पीशिएशन है या इस किस्म की जेनेटिक्स की जो बात है ये किसी एक तय शुदा डेफिनेशन के लिए डेफिनेशन में हम नहीं बांध सकते क्योंकि जिस तरह बायोलॉजी इजाद हो रही है जिस तरह नई नई बातें अंडरस्टैंडिंग में आ रही है हम देख रहे हैं कि एवोल्यूशन और प्रजातिकरण या स्पीशी स्पेशिएशन का भी दायरा है वो बढ़ते जा रहा है उनके चैलेंजेस भी बढ़ते जा रहे हैं और दायरा भी बढ़ते जा रहा है जैसे मॉस्को जू में सर ने कहा कि टाइगर और लाइगर के बीच भी उन्होंने मेटिंग करा के लाइ लाइगर एक नया एक जानवर वहां पे पैदा हुआ है तो अब ये हम जाने कि ये जो स्पेशिएशन है ये जरूर हम बोल सकते कि जरूरी नहीं कि है ये कोई तयशुदा इसमें ही आगे बढ़ेगा इसके लिमिटेशन भी है इसमें कुछ नई बातें भी हमको अंडरस्टैंडिंग में लानी पड़ेगी जैसे डीएनए भी है जैसे हमने देखा एपिजेनेटिक्स है ये एक नया ही भाग पता चला है कि जो एक्टिवेट हो सकता तो कहीं ना कहीं हमको उस नई चीज के लिए जरूर तैयार रहना चाहिए और इसी से सर ने बोला कि नई जो सिंथेटिक थेरी ऑफ एवोल्यूशन है या उत्क्रांति थी उत्क्रांति की एक नई जो मॉडर्न सिंथेटिक थेरी है उसको हम इस तरह देखे कि डार्विन का बेस डार्विन का जो बेस है उसको और हम जो नई अंडरस्टैंडिंग डेवलप कर रहे हैं मॉडर्न जेनेटिक अंडरस्टैंडिंग अनुवांशिकता के नाम से या स्पीशिएशन के नाम से उसका और डार्विन का जो जिसको हम कहते हैं इन दोनों को साथ में रखकर जो अंडरस्टैंडिंग हमारी डेवलप हुई ये इसको हम मॉडर्न सिंथेटिक थेरी उत्पत्ति की या उत्क्रांति की हम कह सकते हैं तो इस तरह ये सर next slide uh, i will quickly go through all the evidence that we have for evolution because you know quite often when you discuss evolution even though it is one of the most profound beautiful scientific theories of all time uh, you have a lot of people trying to deny it right and, and you need to be able to argue why it is fundamentally true and the different ways of arguing uh, why evolution is almost certainly the correct way of thinking about this uh, the way i have described it Uh, so far is to understand that well the first thing is biochemistry the all animals have basically deep down inside them within the nuclei within their cells the vast majority of them have dna and so the basic fact that every every organism plant human being uh, uh, with the exception of a few viruses uh, depend on dna to store its genetic information such as that there is something in common between them and they also the vast majority of organisms uh, um, except for uh, very uh, you know very primordial forms of things that are almost non living that live at the bottom of the oceans they use this molecule known as adenosine triphosphate to transfer energy uh, within the cell so it is the same chemical processes that are happening in the different kinds of cells of of both plants and and human beings everywhere Uh, sorry plants and animals uh, all kinds of organisms so the fact that the biochemistry within each cell is the same suggests that there is a is is a strong case for why evolution is the correct way to understand uh, uh, the uh, the origin and uh, and uh, of different forms of uh, life life the second thing is that they all have for example things you think of as evolutionarily similar have similar genes so i told you that the dna can be thought of as a long sentence and uh, you can, here you can see a, a section from a human dna here you can see a section from a, a chimpanzee dna and another section from the gorilla dna and you'll see that except for these things which are highlighted in red which are different the the sentence is more or less the same so you can think of these these uh, these organisms at the genetic level as varying very little and things like mutation are what lead to these these uh, these uh, differences of course i'm just showing you a small part from a sentence that is 3 billion base pairs long then um, so uh, the the level of overlap the how 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 similar uh, is also dependent on how how
how close uh, the, uh, the the difference is less than 1.2 percent whereas because you know the, we we are as i'll show you later we are supposed to have evolved from great apes we have very recent common ancestors with the chimpanzee whereas if you compare against a mouse with whom we have common ancestors much further back in his uh, evolutionary history the level of uh, overlap uh, uh, or the difference is much larger it is 15 percent so this is uh, one of the evidence for evolution the other thing is of course geological records for example uh, today thanks to nuclear physics we understand we believe that uh, you know earth is about 4.5 to 5 billion years old we have different layers within the earth and in each of those layers you see fossil and each of those layers are caused by different geological ages different geological processes like asteroids hitting us and causing the extinction of di uh, dinosaurs and so on and fossils um in within the same layers are similar to each other Whereas fossils uh, with, between different layers suggest that uh, in, in a later era, uh, the organisms evolved from an earlier era. And the, these resemblances also strongly suggest evolution. So, for example, as you go deeper to different layers of the earth, you reach uh, older and older periods of uh, uh, history of the earth and you see different fossils. And within the layer, the fossils are similar to each other, whereas if you trace it among different layers, you'll see that you'll see clear signs that the later layers, uh, uh, the fossils, uh, the organisms corresponding to the fossils in the latter layers probably evolved from the earlier layers. There is also, for example, comparative anatomy. So how different bones, uh, muscles, etc. in different organisms link to each other. Uh, this uh, is found to be similar across uh, uh, organisms that are very different. For example, the number of uh, how bones link to each other in the wings of a bird, in the arm of a man, in the foreleg of a horse, the, the, the link structure is the same, even though the shapes are different and the function is different. And that, uh, uh, the, again, if you build an evolutionary tree, you can, you can see these structures. The other thing is that if you study embryos of different organisms, they all look the same very early on. So this is a fish embryo, this is a reptile embryo, this is a bird embryo, and this is a human embryo. And as you can see, they all have the same shape. And it's only as these cells differentiate and become different organs, do these uh, embryos differentiate into different organisms. So I will allow uh, Subodh to translate uh, this session about evidence for evolution. And then we will uh, move on to the next step. So evolution ya utkranti me belief ya na belief karne wale log aaj bhi maujood hai. To hum jo hai hum ye reh reh hai ki hum evolution ke kuch jisko hum science me kehte hai ki hum uske kuch evidences de reh hai hum uske sabood de reh hai. To biochemistry jo hai usme hum dekh reh ki DNA humne dekha biochemistry jeh hai. Uh, अगर हम देख रहे हैं कि डीएनए सब में मौजूद है इसका मतलब है सब में ये सिमिलर कंपोनेंट होता है यानी एक कॉमन एंसेस्टर रहा होगा है ना और ये जो इंफॉर्मेशन है सभी इन ऑर्गेनिज्म uh, में डीएनए के द्वारा ही पास हो रही है ये भी कॉमन देखा है और एटीपी uh, जो है एडिनोसिन ट्राइफॉस्फेट एनर्जी का जो कैरियर uh, 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 होता है सेल्स में वो भी हम सभी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन ऑर्गेनाइज ऑर्गेनिजम्स में देखते हैं सभी लिविंग uh, ऑर्गेनिज्म में देखते हैं ये बायोकेमिस्ट्री लेवल पे अब नेक्स्ट पे आते हैं हम एविडेंस uh, टू uh, यानी सिमिलर जीन्स जैसे हम देखते हैं ह्यूमंस चिंपेंजी गोरिला इनका जेनेटिक कोड आप देखते हैं सर नेक्स्ट स्लाइड प्लीज इनके जेनेटिक कोड में आप देखिए ऑलमोस्ट सिमिलर कहीं कहीं डिफरेंस है देखिए और जैसे सर ने कहा कि ये जो थ्री बिलियन लंबाई की जो जेनेटिक कोड है इसका जरूर ये छोटा पार्ट है लेकिन आप देखिए सिमिलर जीन्स ऑलमोस्ट सिमिलर जीन्स है ये तो इससे हम ये देखते हैं कि अगर एवोल्यूशन या उत्क्रांति हुई है तो इस तभी ये सब हो पा रहा है ना हम ये देखते हैं कि आइडेंटिकल या इस किस्म की जेनेटिक इंफॉर्मेशन जो है पास ऑन हुई है इसका मतलब है कहीं ना कहीं ये एक दूसरे से जरूर जुड़े और तीसरा हम देखते हैं कि जियोलॉजिकल रिकॉर्ड्स यानी हमारी अर्थ जो है 
है ना हमारे फॉसिल्स जो मिले हैं है ना फॉसिल मतलब जैसे डायनासोर के फॉसिल मिले हैं अलग अलग किस्म के अलग अलग समय के फॉसिल्स मिलते हैं जिस जिसमें हम देखते हैं ऑर्गेनिज्म भी डेवलप हुए हैं तो वो कहीं ना कहीं हम देखते हैं अर्थ जो है इतनी साल पुरानी इसका रिकॉर्ड मिलता है हाँ और प्रो कैरियोटिक लाइफ जो तीन थ्री पॉइंट फोर बिलियन ईयर पहले भी जो लाइफ रही है उसके हमको फॉसिल्स मिले हैं तो ये क्या दर्शाता है ये भी एक एवोल्यूशन का ही एक वो है जो स्टेट स्लेट लेयर्स स्टाटा लेयर्स है रॉक्स के ये देखिए हम हर 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 जनरेशन में एक एक लेवल का फॉसिल मिला है जिनमें चेंजेस हमने देखे हैं अब इसका और एक वो है देखेंगे एग्जाम्पल एविडेंस की कंपेरेटिव एनाटोमी जिसको हम कहते हैं यानी हड्डियों का या ये जो ढांचा है ये हर ऑलमोस्ट हर इसमें कुछ ना कुछ सिमिलरिटी जैसे पक्षी के विंग्स या फिर इंसान के हाथ या जो हॉर्स है उनके सामने के पैर इनमें आप देखते हैं कि सिमिलरिटी है है ना कुछ बर्ड्स में हॉर्स में मैं में है ना कुछ सामने के हाथों में लगभग सिमिलरिटी होती है ये भी आप हमने देखा है है ना ऐसे ही फिर एम्ब्रियोलॉजी यानी जो सबसे बेबी जब होते हैं जब उसका बेबी होने के पहले जो एम्ब्रियो डेवलप होता है लेकिन देखिए फिश रेप्टाइल बर्ड और ह्यूमन ऑलमोस्ट देखिए हम सिमिलर दिखते हैं एम्ब्रॉय लेवल पे तो ये ये एग्जाम्पल ही हुए एवोल्यूशन होने के ये सर सो दिस फाइनली अलाउज अस टू इंट्रोड्यूस व्हाट वी कॉल अ फाइलोजेनेटिक ट्री एंड अ फाइलोजेनेटिक ट्री बेसिकली हैज द स्ट्रक्चर एट देयर इज ऑलवेज अ ब्रांचिंग um there is a root and then it'll it'll branch on to a to, to different nodes and what it basically tells you is how how different species are related to each other so uh, this the the tree that you see here is uh, uh, tell uh, is the phylogenetic tree of multicellular uh, organisms uh, which are animals and as you can see uh, we have common ancestors with all other mammals um uh, very uh, uh, in very nearby in time uh, but uh, also all other vertebrates but uh, for example uh, with starfishes and sea urchins etc um we have uh, the the common ancestors are further back in time and about 700 million years ago we had common ancestors uh, with also uh, uh, for example uh, insects um and mollusks and uh, you know uh, things like uh, um um uh, uh, the 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 shrimp that we eat or or um, uh, um uh, yeah the snails etc we, uh, around 700 million years ago uh, there was a form of life which uh, evolved separately to give rise to both mammals today and uh, also these other animals this is at least the belief we have based on these records Uh, a thing that needs to be said about uh, you know based on uh, the progression of the stock so far is that none of these things need to be believed to be the absolute truth these are all uh, things that are constantly evolving based on the fossil record based on genetic information and our understanding of genetic changes which are all incomplete and slowly changing um and the the phylogenetic tree is like a family tree the root of the tree represents a distant ancestor of the species that appears at the end of the branches and the branches separated nodes or points where ancestral lines split into new lines of evolution and the tree shows the relationships among common groups of animals the main branch in this tree which separates the animals into two distinct groups uh, split about 700 million years ago the tree shows how today's animal species have diverged over time from common ancestors i'll just show you another example of a phylogenetic tree this is in the case for for my, uh, microscopic organisms so um how uh, thing uh, you know different types of bacteria different types of fungi um and uh, 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 originated from each other if you wanted to understand how this phylogenetic tree fits into the earlier phylogenetic tree the earlier phylogenetic tree connects somewhere here right so this this root of this phylogenetic tree connect somewhere here on this tree and that is how you understand phylogenetic trees 
And so this is just a way of visualizing our information of how species are connected to each other across time and also with respect to each other at a given point in time. I will let uh, Subodh explain the phylogenetic tree to you in Hindi and then we'll move on to the next step, which is the promise of this talk. Yeah. So, we um, come um, to the phylogenetic tree. We have seen that we have seen the evolution of the evolution इस तरह हमने देखा है कि उसका एक प्रमाण जियोलॉजिकल एविडेंस भी रहा और इसी जियोलॉजिकल आधार पे जैसे फॉसिल्स मिले हैं और उनका कालखंड हमने समझ के लिया उस बेसिस पर ये लगभग 700 मिलियन साल से जो जुड़े हुए फॉसिल्स मिले हैं उस बेस पर ये दो एक ऐसे ट्री का हमने फाइलोजेनेटिक ट्री हमने देख रहे हैं जिसमें एवोल्यूशन के भी प्रमाण मिल रहे हैं अलग अलग समय काल में आ, अलग अलग किस्म की प्रजातियां डेवलप हुई है और आ, आ, इन दोनों भी फाइलोजेनेटिक लेवल्स पर आ, किस किस किस्म के आ, अलग अलग दौर में जीव रहे हैं और उनका हाल फिलहाल में अब इनका जैसे ये इंसेक्ट है यहाँ पर और यहाँ हम जानवर मैमल्स या एनिमल्स है वो एक है जो जिनको कॉर्ड कॉर्डेट्स भी कहा जाता है वर्टिबेट्स भी कहा जाते हैं वे लोग हैं इंसेक्ट्स तो ये पूरी ये फाइलोजेनेटिक ट्री जो है हम देख रहे हैं अब यही जो है माइक्रो ऑर्गेनिज्म लेवल पे भी हम देखते हैं कि वहां पर बैक्टीरिया आर्किया यू इस इस किस्म का वहां पर भी फाइलोजेनेटिक्स देखा जाए है देखा गया है जो इस फाइलोजेनेटिक ट्री से ट्री में भी शुमार होता है लेकिन लेकिन हम देखते हैं कि वो एक माइक्रो ऑर्गेनिज्म को रिलेटेड हो अभी हम शायद सर से संपर्क वो सर Sir, I'm not sure. Yes, sir. I got disconnected, but I'm going okay, to share okay, again. And uh, sorry yes, about sir. that. It's okay. So uh, proceed, sir. Okay. So uh, we have understood phylogenetic trees. Now this allows me to, you know, finally just summarize what I promised in the beginning, which is how did human beings uh, originate, and the full story, the four and a half billion year old story of how life evolved into humans, is that. In the beginning, we had some extremely self, uh, uh, simple forms of things that you would maybe not even consider life in its in some sense. They were just RNA molecules capable of rep replicating. So it is believed that even before DNA, you had RNA because it's easier for things to ra by random coincidence come together. But by the mechanisms that I explained, uh, some of these uh, evolved uh, to have a DNA because DNA is more stable. And uh, as a result, information can be stored there um, uh, more efficiently. And also they evolved to be able to move because moving allows you to go search for uh, nutrition uh, over a wider range rather than just sitting in a place and having nutrition come to you. And slowly unicellular life over a period of 3 billion years um, evolved uh, 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 the simplest forms of cells, which are called prokaryotes, which do not have any complex structures inside them, came together to form eukaryotes, uh, which are cells which have complex structures inside them. Then over the next um, uh, 300 to 400 million years, uh, what we think of as multicellular organisms or animals um, uh, um, originated. And then over 100 million years or so, uh, animals slowly developed what we uh, uh, a spinal cord. So the nervous system evolved, and the nervous system allows you know allowed for all sorts of complexity to exist. Um, in the sense, uh, the animal can now coordinate; it can differentiate function between different parts. And uh, four-legged organisms uh, arose over this uh, subsequent uh, uh, hundred million years or so. And then you get mammals and the mammals uh, uh, subsequently over about 100, uh, uh, about 40 million years also give uh, rights to primates, which are things that we think of as modern monkeys. And the human species in our anatomically modern form 
um, uh, produced, uh, sorry, I wouldn't say primates are modern monkeys. Primates are the things that but existed maybe 50 to 100 million years ago. And around 300,000 years ago, the human beings formed. And so this is a continuous stretch. So in a phylogenetic tree, if you follow all the branch from the simplest form of life, at each node, you fo you keep going closest to human being, uh, to, to what becomes a human being. This is the this is the um, uh, this is the picture you will get, and uh, what you see of as uh, uh, with green points at each stage is um, you know uh, 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 is represented by a gain of function or a body part, a new new kind of complexity has arisen. And the rough timeline of this is, is presented here. Once again, you don't need to think of any of this as absolutely true. Such things are not, uh, you should not think of biology as a field of science where you should think of anything as absolutely true. The understanding of all of this is constantly evolving as we find more um, fossils, etc. And human beings are also still evolving, you know, uh, even as we speak, uh, uh, different, the frequency of genetic diseases, uh, how they are among human beings, all of these are changing. And uh, uh, so this is this is basically the promise of human evolution that uh, that I, I uh, that I you know uh, kind of promised you on slide one. But uh, now that we have all the tools to understand it, uh, this is a brief story in in one simple picture form of how we organ we we reached here from the simplest forms of life that we believe existed maybe four and a half billion years ago. Yes. So Jesse uh, slides ki shurvat me sir ne kiata ki hamne ek kisam ki journey dekhi hai ki kese uh is utkanti ke siddhant ko ham hamne paradar parat हमने छाना डार्विन के माध्यम से देखा हमने मेंडल्स के माध्यम से देखा कि हमने डीएनए सेल्स उसके बाद हम स्पीशीज पे गए तो इन सब का एक मिलाजुला असर देख के हम ये कर हम एक देखते हैं हमने एक फायरोजेनेटिक ट्री या हम उत्पत्ति का एक जो ट्री है उसको हमने देखा और ये उसका एक निचोड़ है जिसमें हम देखते हैं कि सबसे पहला जो जीव है यूनिसेलुलर जिसको सिंगल सेल से वो पनपा है उससे वो एक एक लेवल जैसे आप ग्रीन जो डॉट्स देख रहे हैं वो एक एक उनकी एबिलिटी जो है इंक्रीज होते होते वो प्रो से यू से फिर एनिमेलिया इसमें आया फिर उनमें नर्वस सिस्टम्स जो है सोचने की क्षमता या मूव करने की क्षमता ये डेवलप हुई और ये साढ़े चार बिलियन सालों का ये एक एक कहते हैं ना लॉन्ग स्टोरी शॉर्ट यहाँ पर है और ऐसे ही हमने देख रहे हैं कि आ, कैसे आ, चार लेगेड चार पैरों वाले एनिमल्स का जन्म होता है फिर मेमेलिया जिसको हम कहते हैं जो प्रजनन की एक नई टेक्निक होती है मतलब बिना अंडो के यानी जिसको हम कहते हैं ना मेमेल मेमेलिया जो है अपनी ही प्रज, अलग प्रजनन क्षमता रखने वाले फिर प्राइमेट्स आते हैं फिर इंसानों की तरफ के ज्यादा इरेक्ट मूव करने वाले जीनस होमो आते हैं और यही एंड नहीं होता हम शायद हम आखिरी इंडिविजुअल नहीं इसके बाद भी एवोल्यूशन की प्रोसेस जारी है और सर ये भी कह रहे हैं कि इस पूरे इसमें हम यही नहीं कहते कि यही तरीका रहा होगा लेकिन मोटा मोटी हम देखते हैं जो भी एविडेंसेस मिले हैं उस हिसाब से जिस किस्म की हमको जानकारी मिली है उस हिसाब से हमने इनको जरूर रजिस्टर जरूर किया है तो ये ये पूरा एक एवोल्यूशन जो है ये पूरी एक प्रोसेस है जिसका हम अभी भी भाग है हम भी एक ट्रांजिशन का उसका एक माध्यम है ये सर सो द स्टोरी ऑफ एवोल्यूशन ऑफकोर्स ओनली टेल्स यू हाउ वन फॉर्म ऑफ वॉट यू थिंक ऑफ इज लाइफ बिकम्स अनदर फॉर्म ऑफ लाइफ how did life itself start that is not really part of evolution it is part of another thing called what people call abiogenesis and uh, you know that there is no certainty about it there are many hints people have a lot of speculation and much of the speculation is in the context of thinking of oh could life also have happened on other planets 
um, uh, etc so one of the most interesting bits of um, uh, of science i have seen in the field of understanding uh, or even thinking about abiogenesis is something called the miller urey experiment which is you know physics tells us how the lightest nuclei um, uh, uh, or atoms formed from the big bang um, and so if you just have some of these uh, atoms such as nitrogen uh, carbon hydrogen etc and they are hot then they'll react and form very basic chemicals which are not living but if there is some kind of electric discharge in like a water like medium where these chemicals are there then what is often found is that in the remaining re leftover water uh, after the electric discharge is there you will find complex biological um, um, uh, 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 what you think of as organic compounds like amino acids which then make up proteins uh, which then allow things the ability to replicate themselves and so the how rna was initially formed so this is a speculative idea or it is a plausible notion of how life originated it tells us that all we needed are these elementary uh, light nuclei and the chemicals that form from them being subjected to heat and then some electric discharges in the presence of water and you get the building blocks of what we think of as, as life, which is amino acids, which make up most of our muscle cells, etc. And the fact that this can be demonstrated in a laboratory suggests that in any part of the universe where, uh, where you have these kind of chemicals, which physics tells us should be quite uh, common in, in many of the other planets that we are discovering as exoplanets around the universe, etc. today, if there is electrical activity and if there is water, then there is a possibility for life to originate. This is this is an this is one of the experiment uh, that gives some scientific basis to the idea of abiogenesis. But um, abiogenesis or how life itself began is you should think of it as distinct from the idea of evolution because it you know it at a very philosophical level it is not a con concept of continuity. It is a concept of beginning, right? And so. Um, I will let Subodh explain this and then we'll move on to perhaps the last two or three slides of this talk because it's already two hours and I'm sure everyone is bored. So evolution ya utkranti ke baare hum dekhte hai ki evolution ek form se another form me hoti. Yane, wo pehla form maujud hota hai, wo zinda hota hai ya wo prajnan karta hai. Yana? So usse hi इवॉल्व होता है इवॉल्व हो रहा ना उसमें से इवॉल्व होना तो इसको हम एवोल्यूशन बोलते हैं लेकिन एबियोजेनेसिस का मतलब है कि जीवन का ही उत्पत्ति कहां होता है यानी कुछ चीज जीवंत होने की क्या प्रोसेस रहेगी अब इस बारे में काफी सर्टेनिटी नहीं है यानी कोई बोल नहीं सकता कि इसी वजह से जीवन उत्पन्न हुआ है है ना तो कुछ लोग कहते हैं कि क्योंकि ये पृथ्वी कूल हुई और बाद में अपने आप वो पानी और वो सब आया लेकिन उसका एग्जैक्ट थोड़ा सा एक जिसको कहते हैं ना एक्सपेरिमेंट तौर पे हम देखते हैं कि मिलर यूरे एक्सपेरिमेंट में हमने देखा है कि गैसेस जो फॉर्म हुई है इस एटमॉस्फेयर में जो शायद उस ठंडे होने के बाद जो मेन गैसेस रही थी जिसको एन एस थ्री अमोनिया हाइड्रोजन मीथेन और पानी आ, और इन इनके साथ कुछ इलेक्ट्रिकल वहां पे एक्टिविटी हुई लाइटनिंग हुई जो भी हुआ उसकी वजह से आ, हम देखते हैं कि मिलर यूरे एक्सपेरिमेंट ने एक लेवल का आरएनए का या जिसको हम बोलते हैं ना एक प्रोटीन का आ, हमने आ, एक पॉसिबिलिटी देखी है ना तो आर एन ए या एक, एक प्रोटीन की तरफ बढ़ते हुए ये वातावरण हो सकता है गैसेस और इलेक्ट्रिकल है ना पानी मेन तो है पानी और इलेक्ट्रिकल इफेक्ट इन सब का मिला जुला असर होने की वजह से इस किस्म की लाइफ को या एबिजेनिस का आधार जरूर हो सकता है लेकिन ये कोई अः बोलते ना ठोस पन से नहीं कह सकता ये सर ओके okay. So this brings us to, uh, I'll just mention a, a development perhaps in the last 10 years in biology, which is, uh, which is a development in the, in the understanding of evolution, which is the concept of a holobion. So 
we spoke about species we spoke about what is a species what is an organism how different members of a species are different organisms etc but most things that you, and and how genetics is related to it how dna encodes for that organism but it turns out most things you think of as a single organism are not actually a single organism but are actually many organisms living together in a symbiotic relationship for example human beings our our uh, you know digestive tract our gut contains uh, billions of uh, other microorganisms including bacteria and we are intimately dependent or we are very dependent on these organisms to live many aspects of our digestion are actually performed by these organisms which do not contain our genetic material they are their own things they uh, which live with us in a symbiotic relationship and if it weren't for them we would die because we wouldn't be able to di digest many things and we would be unhealthy and this has been for example recently seen that uh, babies uh, who are born uh, through cesarean sessions instead of normal births they do not come into contact with their mothers in the same way um, that um, uh, a, a baby that um, who is born through normal birth does and they do not have the gut microbiome and as a result they are more likely to develop autoimmune diseases illnesses etc unless if you actually take a portion of the mother's um, microorganisms living in the mother's gut and transplant it to the baby's gut so this is a standard process in cesarean deliveries today that a portion of the mother's uh, uh, of the microorganisms living in the mother's gut is taken by the doctor and placed in the baby's uh, 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 digestive tract similarly plants um, which um, re rely on uh, absorbing nutrition from the ground they have bacteria living in their roots which help fix nitrogen and if it weren't for those bacteria the plants wouldn't be able to live the the bacteria and the plant are together in a symbiotic relationship and this relationship uh, also transcends reproduction in the sense what you think of as an organism when it reproduces to a next generation of organism uh, the 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 microorganisms that are in a symbiotic relationship with it are somehow tran um, also transferred to the next generation to the extent that you cannot think of um, uh, of a, any organism as directly corresponding to just one sequence of dna it is a collection of cells with different dnas living together in a complex symbiotic relationship and uh, uh, there is also for example the 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 gut microbiome of the human being which consists of all the uh, microorganisms living within the digestive tract of the human being that is just one example our immune system is another example of of a holobiont in the in the sense in, 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 in i'm not using the term holobiont here correctly in fact this is also just like the concept of a species a rather vague term um, denoting the idea that most things that you think of as organisms are actually not from a single genetic lineage or a single sequence of DNA, but they are cells with different sequences of DNA living together, going through complex processes of reproduction wherein they all uh, get transferred together. And some, in some sense, uh, this notion um, uh, goes back about 3 billion years when the first prokaryotic cell um, uh, uh, or the first eukaryotic cell was formed from prokaryotic cells it was multiple different types of cells learning together to live together as one cell in some sense so for example in each human cell you have two types of dna you have dna inside your uh, nucleus which is the dna you get from both your mother and your father through recombination and then there is the dna within the mitochondria alone which you get only from your mother. And it is believed that the mitochondria was a separate cell which uh, entered a prokaryotic cell about three and a half billion years ago and, uh, and, uh, to, and led to what is known as the more complex eukaryotic cell, which consists of all these kinds of uh, uh, cell organelles. So different cells learning to live together is what led to more complex cells. And similarly, different kinds of organisms living together is what you think of as most single organisms and this understanding is something that has happened only over the last five to ten years or so in fact the the first lecture about this i heard was in uh, in 2016 or so while i was a postdoc at the niels bohr institute and nowadays uh, for example in 2023 the economist had a lecture sorry had a had an article 
saying that the idea of holobionts is an ongoing paradigm shift in biology. So this is a very recent understanding in our development of how evolution works, that it is not just genes, genotype versus phenotype and uh, mutations and sexual recombination and variation and survival of the fittest. It's also quite often organisms at a microscopic and an even macroscopic level learning to live together as one unit. And most things that you think of as an organism are also societies in some way. The human body is a society of microorganisms living together within our guts, within our immune systems, etc. So this is a development in, a, in the understanding of evolution that has happened very recently. And uh, like I said, evolution is an, uh, the, our understanding of evolution is an ongoing process. It is continuously changing. So I will let Subodh uh, explain this before we move on to the final slide so we can conclude. अब हम आते हैं हाल फिलहाल के अंडरस्टैंडिंग पर जिसको हम होलो बॉइंट सर ने कहा तो होलो बॉइंट क्या है तो हम देख रहे हैं कि अभी तक हम देख रहे हैं कि इंसान को या किसी प्लांट को या किसी भी ऑर्गेनिज्म को एज अ सिंगल ऑर्गेनिज्म हम देखते हैं लेकिन होलो बॉइंट का होलो बॉइंट जो कंसेप्ट है उसका ये मानना है कि ये आ, हम इंसान अलग अलग ऑर्गेनिज्म से बने हुए एक इंडिविजुअल या एक ऐसे कंपोनेंट है जिसमें अलग अलग ऑर्गेनिज्म एक साथ बनप रहे हैं हम उनका उनका वो हमारे भीतर मौजूद है जिंदा है और वो आपस में एक सहजीव बोलकर रह रहे हैं एक दूसरे से मिला के चल रहे हैं ठीक है और लेकिन अगर हम उनको अलग कर दे तो मे भी वो एक दूसरे के बिना सरवाइव नहीं करेंगे यही प्लांट्स में भी अप्लाई हो रहा है और इसी तरह से हम देख रहे हैं कि गट माइक्रोब की बात की सर ने कि कुछ जो माइक्रोब्स है जो मदर या फादर के डाइजेस्टिव सिस्टम में होते हैं अगर वो बच्चे को ना मिले जो कि जनरली सिजेरियन इसमें जब बच्चा पैदा होता है तो वो गट माइक्रोब नहीं मिलते हैं या फिर जो डेस्ट्यूबिया इसमें नहीं मिलते हैं जो बच्चे जन्म लेते हैं उस माध्यम से तो डॉक्टर्स क्या करते हैं जो माइक्रोब्स माँ के डाइजेस्टिव ट्रैक में होते हैं वो माइक्रोब्स उठा के उसका पोर्शन उठा के जो नया जन्म लेता है उसके बेबी जन्म लेता है उसके डाइजेस्टिव ट्रैक में डाला जाता है ताकि वो माइक्रोब्स जो है उस जनरेशन के इस नए जनरेशन में भी आए और वो बच्चा अपने ऑलमोस्ट माँ और बाप के ही जो हेल्थ सिस्टम है उसके हिसाब से वो आगे एक्ट करे और अपना हेल्थ उसका बेटर रहे तो ये ये जो होलो बॉइंट का टोटल जो कंसेप्ट है वो है कि हम एक ऑर्गेनिज्म नहीं है हमारे भीतर भी ऑर्गेनिज्म है जो कि एक दूसरे से मिला के चल रहे हैं और इसकी सबसे पहली जो एग्जांपल वो है वो है कि एक सेल जो जिसको हम प्रोकैरियोटिक बोलते हैं जो सिर्फ एक ही इन, आ, एक ही यूनिट हुआ करता था उसका डेवलप होना यू सेल में जो बहुत ही कॉम्प्लेक्स है वो कॉम्प्लेक्स होने से इसका मतलब ही आता है कि उसके भीतर ही हमने अलग अलग ऑर्गेनिज्म के सहजीवन का हमने उसमें पनपना देख लिया है, है ना तो प्रोकोरियोटिक सेल से यूकोरियोटिक सेल में ट्रांसफर होना ही इस होलो पॉइंट का बहुत बड़ा शुरुआत का पॉइंट हम देख सकते हैं जिस वजह से हम देख रहे हैं कि होलो पॉइंट की जो मुख्य धारा है होलो पॉइंट का जो मान्यता है वो है कि एक ऑर्गेनिज्म खुद में ही अपने अंदर एक सोसाइटी रखता है अलग अलग ऑर्गेनिज्म की जो सहजीव या सिम्बैटिक रिलेशन में होते हैं और वो अपना एवोल्यूशन कैरी करते सोचिए वो ऑर्गेनिज्म जो अपने भीतर मौजूद है वो भी अपना एक एवोल्यूशन कैरी कर रहे हैं वो भी इवॉल्व हो रहे हैं तो ये इन पिछले दस सालों का मिलाजुला एक नया आ, हम कहते हैं मान्यता साइंटिस्ट ने हमारे सामने रखी ये सब सो दिस ब्रिंग दिस लेट्स मी रियली कंक्लूड दिस टॉक विच यू नो 
I mean, I had planned on like a 40 minute talk, but with the simultaneous translation, what is happening is it has now gone on for about two hours, 20 minutes, right? So uh, evolution is is an understanding of how how organisms and populations accumulate changes over many generations and become other species. Though Darwin is considered the father of this idea, he himself was improving upon earlier notions by introducing concepts such as natural selection and survival of the fittest. These ideas are today completed with an understanding or, or they are more completed. They will never be perfectly completed. There's always more things to understand with an understanding of genetics, molecular biology and heredity, etc. Um, ideas such as species and gene, they capture notions about a much more complex process that's happening in nature. And so they don't have very strict, rigorous definitions that everybody agrees on. They, they capture something even more nuanced uh, than you would you would be able to think of with a definition. Evolution allows a coherent narrative about the origin of us human beings from the simplest form of life uh, to be to be presented. So appreciating how all of these things are happening in nature and all of the scientific evidence we have allows us to have a coherent narrative across history of how we came to be. It is of course never complete. There are loads of holes. Uh, it is ever changing with various questions always popping up regarding how something could have happened, what is the path through which something could have happened, if two one species evolved from something else, was there intermediate species, are there spe fossils to be found, etc. And these questions are being answered through careful research. Uh, 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 an example I can think of is, for example, sexual reproduction. Why do we reproduce sexually? There is no evolutionary uh, evolutionary answer to us. To it, sexual reproduction, of course, gives a huge advantage in terms of allowing for more variability. But you know, asexual reproduction is much easier than sexual reproduction. You, for, for sexual reproduction, you always need to go find a mate, whereas asexual reproduction, you can just reproduce yourself. So, organisms that reproduce asexually should be able to out reproduce and compete with sexually reproducing organisms. But the fact that sexual reproduction exists in nature, this is currently believed to be a paradox. Nobody has an answer. The scientific, the biological community, if you ask them, they'll give you a lot of opinions and there is no consensus on this. So, so evolution is not something we understand 100%, but it is, it is happening right in front of us, as I demonstrated through this talk and the examples of the moth and the breeding of different types of dogs and so on. It is unquestionable. People who deny evolution are denying a basic scientific reality. And that is the conclusion I have for you. Thank you. So, uh, conclusion mein hum dekhte hai ki evolution ya uh, kranti hik aisa uh, paradigm hai jis mein hum uh, changes ke dwara uh, uh, humare bhitar alag alag generation mein jo changes aaye hai uh, aur humko ek प्रजाति में कन्वर्ट करने की उन्होंने कोशिश की है या प्रजाति में हम उसके द्वारा कन्वर्ट हुए डार्विन जरूर इसके जनक माने जाते हैं लेकिन उन्होंने भी पिछले कुछ ऐसे ही नोशंस पे काम करके इसको हमारे सामने रखा और अपनी कुछ कंसेप्ट जैसे नेचुरल सिलेक्शन और सर्वाइवल ऑफ द फिटेस्ट को हमारे सामने रखा लेकिन इन आइडियाज को हम जेनेटिक्स मोलिकुलर बायोलॉजी और जिसको हम देखते हैं हेरिडिटी से हमने जोड़ना जरूर चाहिए तभी ये अंडरस्टैंडिंग बेटर रहेगी ये जो स्पीशीज है जीन कैप्चर जैसे है ये आजकल नए आइडियाज को हमने भी सोचने की जरूरत है इन बारे में जानने की जरूरत है हमारे अस्तित्व में एवोल्यूशन या उत्पत्ति का सिद्धांत ये बहुत कारगर रहता है कि हम अपने आप को डिफाइन कर पाए हम कहा से पनपे हैं हम कहा से आए हैं इसलिए ये बहुत इम्पोर्टेंट है हालांकि एवोल्यूशन को बहुत सारे चैलेंजेस है एवोल्यूशन के माने जिसको हम कहते हैं नई जनरेशन का स्पीशीज का किसी भी तरह से आना जिस सर ने कहा सेक्सुअल रिप्रोडक्शन को माना जाता है कि मोस्ट कॉमन वो है लेकिन इसके अलावा भी अगर कोई माध्यम हो सकते हैं तो उसके लिए हम जरूरी नहीं हम एक चीज पर हम अड़ जाए तो इसमें चैलेंजेस भी हैं अलग अलग पाथवेज हैं इसके बहुत सारे 
सवाल मौजूद है इन इन पर रिसर्च जरूर होनी चाहिए और हो रही है लेकिन एवोल्यूशन या उत्क्रांति ये क्वेश्चनेबल नहीं क्योंकि ये हमारे आंखों के सामने हो रहा है ये सर तो हम क्वेश्चंस के लिए भी खुले हैं अगर सर के पास समय हो तो आ, बहुत कम समय हमारे पास बचा है वी विल इफ इफ देर आर एनी क्वेश्चन प्लीज रेज हैंड और टाइप इन द चैट बॉक्स बिकॉज वी हैव एक्चुअली क्रॉस द टाइम वी टूक वेरी लॉन्ग दैट्स वाई मे बी वी कुड पुट मे बी दूडेंट्स कुड पुट दर क्वेश्चन इन अवर कम्युनिटी community page of digital nalanda or any or are there, are there any questions on uh, youtube sapna tai so uh, just uh, a, a brief thing there uh, uh, i just uh, i mean uh, recently i heard about uh, some Uh, 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 kind of plants or algae developing near the chernobyl uh, uh, disaster place so it is said to be uh, very much uh, uh, it has evolved in the sense it it uh, actually absorbs the radiation so is it um, what could it be it's it's a uh, evolution or it's a totally new species we we, we could say well uh, i mean the basic point of this lecture was that evolution leads to totally new species and yeah. external external input such as being exposed constantly to radiation can do that so yeah uh, I, i'm i'm not 100% sure of the question but it could be a totally new species that has come through due to evolution due to this external uh, you know uh, pressure from uh, from radiation so the same way you can think of lack of food or competition you now have a additional thing that is radiation is trying to kill you so uh, in most organisms how radiation kills you is it causes your dna strands to break and it causes your cellular reproduction mechanism to break down at a fundamental level but um, if you build so of course organisms also have mechanisms to repair this uh, to some extent uh, but it's just like you know it's like Uh, if if there's too much radiation it gets overwhelmed but um, uh, it's possible that some of these organisms have the ability to repair very fast and survive even through radiation i do not think it can absorb radiation in the sense that it can actually stop because to stop ionizing radiation that's really a fundamental physical process so you know you need a, a, a volume of dense matter uh, uh, with a certain number of nuclei Per uh, per unit volume to actually stop radiation. What it could be doing is that it could actually be absorbing gamma rays uh, yeah. the same way uh, the same way leaves are absorbing photons uh, yes. and turning it into energy uh, through photosynthesis. The, it is possible that something could be absorbing gamma rays uh, by setting up some elaborate network of of, of biological systems. so um like as because you know gamma rays are just photons uh, the same kind yes. of that leaves used to uh, to photosynthesize energy gamma rays are just higher energy versions of it um so uh, but i don't think they can really absorb and stop uh, radiation i don't think living things really can do that you need really dense material like lead etc to be able to do that but um, i'm being carried away by answering the physics aspect of this question rather than no. the biology aspect which is that yeah but uh, yes so we have possibilities and we have uh, many more questions but we cannot deny the existence of evolution aaj ke curiosity lecture mein humne kafi sare pehlu ko chhua hai और डॉक्टर रमीश से हमारी मुलाकात की है डॉक्टर रमीश ने हमको समय दिया वी आर वेरी थैंकफुल टू यू सर फॉर टेकिंग आउट सो इम्पोर्टेंट टाइम ऑफ योर्स फॉर आवर स्टूडेंट्स 
and um, I'm sure uh, our students will be, um, uh, I mean, it, it this kind of curiosity lectures and uh, ma majority of students have been uh, actually looking forward to such lectures. And uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Ramis, for conducting uh, such sessions for our students uh, for the benefit of of the young science enthusiast if uh, i i may say so uh, thank you uh, sir again uh, for taking out time and uh, all yes sir uh, no i mean i should thank you because i i mean i got this opportunity to give a talk on a topic which you know i mean in an academic context no one would ask me to speak about evolution mm -hmm. right but uh, it's something i read about and i'd like i i don't know i hope what i've said makes sense uh, it is possible that some things I said could have been wrong or in how you translated it, it could have been wrong because, for example, during the whole thing about the gut microbiome, you said the yeah. gut microbiome also from the from the father, but there is no process by which yeah. during birth you get it from your father, you get it yeah. from your mother. So yes. there, are, there, there will be small errors here and there in this lecture due to, well, limitations in my knowledge, limitations in translation. Yes. But the the basic idea, I hope, is that you all got some concepts you can Google and and you know update yourself with, and maybe you got excited by some of these ideas. So that's that's what I was hoping for. Yes, and I should really thank you for giving me this opportunity. So thank yes, you. Uh, we we are actually uh, because these uh, these series actually mean. Uh, uh, a lot to our um, students basically who uh, come from uh, such backgrounds who may not have been receiving uh, such kind of elaborate explanation about uh, these concepts. So again, thanks uh, so much, uh, Dr. Ramiz. And jude rahiye digital nalanda se hamare agle session mein hum milenge. So thank you for now and uh, bye. Jai Bhim. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yes. bye. bye.